I know a little bit about that world when we were doing the live video streaming type of stuff. So, all right, I'm, I'm going to keep the live button. All right. I'll let you give me the thumbs up. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. Our guest today is Eddie. I'm going to let it say his own last name. I'm sure I'll butcher it. Eddie Maziregos. Eddie, you ready to be great today? Every day. Let's do it. Eddie is the founder of Future Gen, a Gen Z career exploration platform for high schoolers. He's found a love for the question, what do you want to do in the future? Has built multiple mentorship, career exploration, and company culture programs in university and company settings across the years. Some other fun facts about Eddie is that he's an Eagle Scout. His favorite superhero is Spider-Man, and no one could cook better enchiladas than his mother. Eddie, so I'm going to start with a softball question. Let's do it. Everyone says they're a dog lover. However, you are really a dog lover, right? I'm mistaken. But um, you actually have a LinkedIn profile picture of you and your dog, right? This is uh, this is true. I cannot tell a lie. A little snack, a little like backpack your dog in it, whatever. Yeah, he's like partner in crime. I carry with him wherever I, I can go, essentially. So talk about you know how how you can, like put that, just tell us about your dog. So that cute little guy that you may see on my picture every now and then, his name is Theo, and he's um uh, he just turned three years old. And gosh, there's so much cool stuff. Like I, I have so many experiences with him from the moment I actually had the opportunity to, to adopt him. Believe it or not, I drove a thousand miles to get him, and it wasn't a that that itself was quite something. Um, but we you know we've gone on camping trips together. I trained him to go on my back. You know, we'll go biking every now and then. And you know, quite recently, actually, we relocated to Redmond, Washington because of this legendary park called uh, Marymore Park. They have an off the dock, like off the leash dog park there. And I swear to you not, it has like a hundred acres, just all completely available for dogs. They have a river going through it. So dogs can even go jump in there and it's his backyard now. So, so what kind of dog is it again? He's a Corgi, a little tricolored Corgi. Corgi. Yeah. And why are Corgi versus like all the numerous hundreds of thousands of other breeds out there? You know, I think my sister has some inspiration for that. Uh, I basically went up to my sister and like, you know what? Um, work from home kind of just got in place. Like, you know, I, I feel like this is my time to have a buddy of mine. And I was like, what do you think about a Corgi? He's like, that's a great idea. Let's jump on this. And she literally just started talking to um, house, the home, to uh, breeder, to every single place that you can find where, where you can maybe find a Corgi. And it just kind of happened. It just felt like a calling. And so the Corgi, I guess it stays at home when you're out doing your stuff. Or you are, are, are you are you such are you so much a dog lover? You have a, you have a, like a dog sitter coming and walking your dog every day, or like how far do you go? I would say right now my girlfriend is the dog sitter right now. So I do like taking him with me wherever I can go. So yes, I've taken him on flights with me. Yes, I have taken him with me, and he's like a great war road warrior with me when I go on some long trips. But you know, at home he's uh, he's my girlfriend right now. Are you, are you planning on getting any more dogs in the future? You know, like as like a partner for your dog. What's your dog's name again? Uh, his name is Theo. Theo, Theo's and right. He kind of has a partner right now. You know, he has a. Her name is Willa, and it's actually my girlfriend's dog. Okay. So it's it's interesting because so made made for double dating. Kinda. I mean, they're they're excellent playmates. But cool. yeah, no, it, it's funny. Uh, Theo, he he did such a great job being him that when I introduced him to my girlfriend's family, he convinced my girlfriend's family to get their first dog, my girlfriend to get her very first dog. And now all her aunts and uncles and relatives and cousins are beginning to slowly get cats and dogs. And so it's just the love spreads, I guess. Yeah. So you have a girlfriend, she's a dog lover. Would you ever consider being with someone who's a cat lover? Well, oh, that's like, that's a red flag. Like you like cats, yeah, I can't deal with you. You know, it's like kind of a common question where like, you know, does pineapple belong in the pizza? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's I, I it's I see food as food. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's like a great comparing, then you know I, I I have yet to have ever date a girl that you know is a cat lover itself. But it's a, uh, you know, that's never say so, never. Yeah, never say never. Um, so next, talking about food. 
So I'm pretty sure being of people disagree with your statement, your, your mother's insulin is the best, right? Everyone's, my mother's the best, right? So why is your mother's insulin the best? Like, what is that the secret sauce she does? The, the tender love of care? Like, what makes her insulin the best? Well, every mother and too does. bad you don't have a, a sample for us right now, huh? Yeah, I know. I know. I feel bad after you giving some samples uh, on, on your table here. But yeah, uh, you know, my mother, like I would imagine most of us does provide like that special love that's in there. But the reason why I know it's the best is because every single time we have guests coming into the house and they taste just a nibble of her enchilada. So it's just not you. It's, it's everyone saying yeah, it. Okay. It's, it's literally like when I say Monterey Bay, California has the best clam chowder, like in the local area, everybody knows my mom has the best enchiladas. Um, have you picked up any cooking tips from your mother? How do you how do your enchiladas prepare? My enchiladas, um, I, I kind of unfortunately don't put as much uh, <laughs> delicate care. I kind of do like an assembly line type of thing. <laughs> she spends hours on it. And I'm just like, okay, how can I get this food in me, kind of thing. So uh, yeah, they had a thing on Instagram the other day. I watched it was like this guy video says simple steps like make a nice meal, and like somebody posted ten thousand steps later, the meal's still not done. You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's I, I gotta say I, I definitely my mother did give me a little uh like thermometer mm -hmm. so you can like stab it in there. So I'm not quite cutting as many chicken legs uh -huh. and steaks in half, seeing redness. I'm like, okay, yeah. now I can still keep it all in peace. Yeah. Um next talk about your you are Eagle Scout, correct? I am. Are you still pretty involved with the Boy Scouts? So um, first question, how does one become an Eagle Scout, right? Is it like it's like you know, like is like is that is that like the black belt of, of Boy Scouts, right? It's the ultimate goal to get Get the Eagle Scout goals or something above Eagle Scout? I would say Eagle Scout is it's once an Eagle Scout, always an Eagle Scout. It's something that if you're a part of the Boy Scouts, it's something that it's did you a common question as a follow up is like, did you get your Eagle? And it's not because like there's, um, you know, Boy Scouts doesn't have value throughout the entirety of the journey, but it's so important to begin and finish what you start. And so with Eagle Scouts, there if you'll you'll you'd be surprised how many of us are sprinkled out wherever you go. And so personally, it's it is a very, very well recognized um, you know, award, not just here amongst Eagle Scouts, but you know, a lot of people get awards through Congress and a lot of scholarships, et cetera. It's uh, honestly one of the best experiences I've had in my life. And what are some things you have to do to become an Eagle Scout? I'm sure it's like a, a strenuous process, right? Yeah. I mean. There, yes, you know, there's the typical Boy Scout stuff where, yeah, you have to go ahead and learn how to tie knots and learn how to go ahead and fire and stuff like that. But in the process of becoming an Eagle Scout, you actually learn so much more than that. So anywhere from, um, so I chose an emphasis in uh, like first aid, EMT, first responder type stuff because I had an interest in becoming a doctor when I was younger, specifically emergency trauma surgeon. And um I would say you, there is always an Eagle Scout project that has to be done, and it can be anything. Um, some people build benches, gardens. I reopen the wildlife corridor, and it's it's yeah. So I, there's some basic stuff you gotta. Yes, there's some core um, hard skills you gotta learn to be prepared, and then there is some leadership that you have to teach to the next generation of scouts, and then you kind of leave your legacy behind when you have when you do your official. Eagle Scout checks. And you get called on one spot like mentor current Boy Scouts who are trying to become Eagle Scouts. Yeah. Um, my my troop to 275 Prunedale, California. Um, I've actually been given a couple of mentor pins from the Eagle Scouts that have gone through the program there. It's uh I didn't ask for it. it it's just, you know, we're kind of, we say it have this oath, you know, scout is trust or is a uh, on my honor would do my best to do my duty to god in my country to help other people at all times keep myself physically strong and mentally awake and so that help other people at all times it's so embedded across i wouldn't just say eagle scouts but just boy scouts as a whole and so just outside even boy scouts i i would say that's something i practice quite um it's, it's quite principal to me and you might not know this, but what percentage of Boy Scouts become Eagle Scouts? I, I have to imagine that percentage, I, would, I guess, be kind of low, right? So it's, there's some like new statistics that are out there, but you know, it's kind of funny. I actually have this book right here that has it on the title, um, The 4%. So it's, 
it can range depending on how you want to play with the stats as four percent make it to eagle scout but some, as in recent times you can get as i think as high as eight so the girl scouts sell cookies i've never seen the boy scouts selling things do, do y'all sell something too or the girl scouts just monopolize all the money from people so we're well known for selling popcorn but i would say it's, i had no clue gone for you i had no clue honestly if i had a choice to sell girl scout cookies as a boy scout sign me up <laughs> Um, but, you know, through a lot of fundraising efforts, especially in my troop, you know, we used to do things like sell firewood. Um, we used to do like mistletoe fund drives. Um, we also used to do uh, uh, like spaghetti fundraisers and stuff like that. Is there any difference between Boy Scouts like you and Girl Scouts? Y'all, y'all both groups basically like learn the same things, do the same things, sort of kind of. It's unfortunately that there is actually a bit of a difference. Um, I, both of them, I tell you, is they're both great programs. But I would say there's probably a different experience that's given across from a Girl Scouts versus a Boy Scouts. And it's a big reason why I'm so supportive of the Boy Scouts initiative when they're actually encouraging um, entire Girl Scout troops now going through the Eagle Scout curriculum. So I think like maybe a a good example is that um, a lot of uh, the Boy Scout type of curriculum that is provided in standard is maybe a little bit, um, has different flexibility in terms of hands-on activities versus the Girl Scouts. So the Girl Scouts don't have their own version of Eagle Scout? So they have something called the Gold Star. Okay. But you don't you don't really hear about the Gold Star, which is, again, is unfortunate. It doesn't have the same amount of weight, I would say, unfortunately. So is there like some kind of like, you know, pose you, you move to, we'll say, Denver, Colorado. Is there some like online form you go, press buttons, and, and, and all the Eagle Scouts in Denver will pop up for you to connect with them? Is that kind of an alumni network like that for you? So there's something called the National Eagle Scout Association, NESA. And so NESA is an organization that, you know, if you're an Eagle Scout, you can actually sign up to there and you can actually say, like, hey, you can reach out to me for mentorship opportunities. You can reach out to for me for just uh, connect over, like, say, LinkedIn or something like that. Um, but no, this is actually like very accurate information. Like I literally have a yellow pages version of Eagle Scouts and it has their contact information from email to their home numbers, which is kind of scary, but also a very powerful tool. Yeah. Is it possible you kicked out the girls, the boys, I mean, the Eagle Scouts or Boy Scouts? Some, someone can do something so bad that you, that you I may get kicked out. I'm sure there is. I mean, like any organization, there's a code of conduct. There is, um, you know, certain uh, standards that we sh- we should always have uh, across any organization universally. I personally have never experienced that. Um, usually, whenever a Boy Scout left the organization at my troop, it was due to um, maybe we're not the best cultural fit. Like our teams were different. Um, we had different interesting activities, um, but unfortunately, or for good reasons, um, we fortunately didn't have any for like misconduct of any kind. Now, a few years ago. I don't remember how long there was a, there was a, lot, a lot of bad prep up the Boy Scouts, like the, the certain Boy Scout mass, like they'll take advantage of young boys. How do you like, like, how do you, for? Like, how do you balance that with the value the Boy Scouts gave you? Like, how can this organization be so great and then let this happen, right? How do you balance that in your mind? You know, I, I yeah, there's actually a lot of that stuff you're talking about still impacts Boy Scouts today. Um, so I, because they had to pay like, like, a, a big fund, and like, then they get to like multi million dollars that I pay like a big fund or something. Entire campsites that have uh, ecosystems around around them had to shut down. Um, my personal local favorite in Monterey County, Pico Blanco, actually had to sell um, itself to another organization so it can, you know, still give the great experiences that uh, youth program and camps can give. But yeah, there is a lot of a uh, consequence to um, to actions. So personally, how I kind of put it in my head is that its core principle, its core mission, its core impact that it has in, across young leaders, it's still there. Um, and this, I would say, uh, reflection was a good North Star compass to then like, hey, we stepped away from that. How do we correct ourselves to ensure that we're still following our true North Star? So I still think that they, uh, they do that fairly well. So both of us favorite superhero is Spider-Man. And so tell me some reasons why Spider-Man is your, your guy. My gosh. I he's so relatable. Isn't he? Um, oh yeah. Like he has all these problems. You know, he loses a girl, gets picked on, you know, like he never give enough. Everything he tries, even when he does something good, it, it turns the shit on him, you know. Like, yeah, so relatable. Yeah, I mean, like every superhero this seems perfect, untouchable. Like they are Thor. Thor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
the, the god of thunder and love yeah like they're, they're just so perfect but in the reality it's just like you know um spider-man just puts that realistic lens in there and like hey he is a hero that experiences loss he's an experience he's a hero that yeah he can win but a lot of those are actually from triumphs over large failures. And so, you know, Spider-Man's been told, no, I don't know how many times, like, no, you, you can't get the girl. No, you can't save, you know, um, save, save the city or save your um, you know, relative. And you know what he did? He said, you know what? I'm going to do my best anyways. And so he's a character. I think he does his best in every way he can. And he himself, cat grows his own personal compass along that time and it's i again i love that yeah he's definitely uh, like a good superhero for entrepreneurs to follow i think right the <laughs> resiliency getting kicked down 10 times getting up 11 times you know never giving up and of course it helps that he's a super genius too right yeah he's uh it definitely doesn't go wrong when you have a good heart and mind and shoulders yes yes so next let's talk about your time about you as a, a, a I think it's called management consultant at a company you can talk about that experience first what is a consultant Define that for everyone. What does what does consultant do or not do? Uh, you know, consultant is kind of like a very broad term. Um, we we just come in when there's a fire and we say like, hey, uh, this is a solution and uh, good luck with that. <laughs> so there's kind of two different types of consultants in my opinion. There are ones I would say are more like a strategic, um, thinking about more at a high level on um, problem solving. And they, these are people that typically build, again, like company um, strategies and stuff like that. But then there's a second type of consultant that is, I would say, like they're very technically skilled um, and have a very strong talent, something specific. And so I fell into the category of the prior, which is trying to think about the current state of things and uh, what are the next best steps to get to the future state. And so how does one become a consultant? Because I'm guessing like you're, you're pretty young, right? Did you ever get feedback like, you're, you're a consultant. You're not 55 years old with 30 years experience. How, how do you like make people think, no, I'm a consultant. I know what I'm doing. You know, I actually didn't know what a consultant was until I left college. Um, and I, I'm, again, I'm the kind of person that I'm like, hey, I'm going to become this person. I, my, my personal drives and ambition are different from, like, let's say, a, a title or a status. So I honestly just wandered into management consulting. I was doing... Uh, Prior to that, I was doing some really large cost-saving uh, projects for a Hyundai Mobis, and uh, that's, that's you. You sound for Hyundai. You're a consultant for Hyundai. I was a consultant for a company called Trivista. Trivista, okay. Um, Trivista is a merger and acquisition with an emphasis towards supply chain strategies, and so I was a part of their rapid operational assessment team, basically identifying uh, red, yellow, green flag opportunities for private equity clients. And your bio was part of the read said you said like gonna dip night dip hotel once a week or something like you just did how to do a lot of oh job. yeah it was uh i think i did that for just about two years i, I did close to like 25 separate projects for mergers and acquisitions and kind of saw the country one hotel what, what was the favorite city you were able to go to seattle seattle actually no i'm lying there um seattle is by far the favorite city i've ever been to um Across my time when I was working at the company, but I actually came here for vacation. Uh, but in terms of city that I have been to, I think um, I had a really good time in Chicago. That was fun. Nice. And, and how about your least favorite? Hmm. Kind of like I would never I, go here again. I had to remember the city, the names of those those like, towns and like the boonies. A, so all these cities you went to, were like big cities, like some like like whole dunk small cities, all that, all them pretty big. It was a mix. Mix. Okay. Um, you can like literally be going to New York one day, or you can literally just be going to um a really random town in Kansas. And you say the same hotel, hotel each time, but they could give hotels. So uh, I had a preference towards Marriott. Marriott, okay. Um, but you know, if you were had to accompany someone else more senior, uh, senior on the team, they would maybe have a preference to one chain or another. Nice. And how long did you do that for? Um, just under two years. Two years. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was interesting. It felt a lot longer than two years. I'm sure it did. Um, because I'm pretty. It was like they work like they don't, don't work like eighty hour weeks. You know, long hours. You know, like it pays good, but the hours suck or something like that. And over served. Yeah, I mean, I definitely spent in quite a bit of time there. There's times where sometimes I was assigned to four separate assignments at a time. And it's like, well, 
you got to be on site for this project. You got to provide remote um, support for this one. Yeah. You got to be leading for the project in India. And so you're just working these wacko hours. Yeah. Um, so again, um, learned a lot, but it was, um, could I see myself doing that for my lifetime? <laughs> like, no. no, like, yeah, like I want to have a life. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it's, Success means different to different people. Success there was something that I was thinking long term wise. No, yeah, best fit. So my pitch. This is my take on HR Cassandra, right? Uh -huh. So I tell people to talk HR Cassandra. Like, close up with Cassandra. I work for you, right? Yeah. I come to you and like, hey Eddie, I, I look your HR stuff over. You need to meet one, two, three, four, five, right? And, yeah. and, and imagine like HR Cassandra charge anything for one hundred dollars, five hundred dollars an hour. So we say I'm charging three hundred dollars an hour. So I say, hey, do you need these HR things, right? You, you're going to say, hey, Jason, I know that's where they'll hire you. What you can you do for me? You're like, oh, no, I, I consult you. Like, I'm not doing it for you. Like, so you were like, so I'm paying you $300 an hour to tell me what I already know. And that's where Kevin Zerk's always trying to know, get, get rid of, you know, trying to take care of that kind of stuff. Um, so after consulting, that's when you switched to your, your current company, right? Your startup. Yeah. It was uh, at one point in time, it kind of just... You know, what I used to do after consulting at locations is on my off time, I would actually go to colleges and, uh, you know, school educational um, sites. And I used to ask a lot of their students there, what do you want to do in the future? And it, it was funny thinking or uh, realizing the different responses I used to get. I used to freak a lot of them out. Yeah, it's a big question. Easy to ask, hard to answer. Um, but during that time, that's how I kind of found three unique profiles or I would say identities I found across these uh, these youth, um, but yeah. So I, I did that for about two years, and then at one point I'm like, "Hey, what happens if my 100% effort, imagining what um, you know career exploration could be?" So why Gen Z versus why only Gen Z? Why not combine different generations together? Because no different generations are in school, that kind of stuff. Why specifically Gen Z? Well, I think you gotta have to pick your battles, especially when you're building a startup. In the sense of, um, you know, focus does a lot of good, especially in the beginning stages, um, picking your niche. And so something that I found was a potential challenge on my end was, um, believe it or not, I, I'm 27. Um, and I just turned 27. And so a lot of people look at me and say, like, what kind of experience could you possibly have? You barely started. And then I'm like, you know what? No. Um, how can I put my position where I'm in into a superpower? And so that's why a Gen Z seemed like an amazing fit uh, in the sense like, hey, I can really relate to the problem because I recently went through the whole process of, you know, post-secondary and like, you know, for myself for many years, asking what do I want to do in the future and um, realize that there's a lot of context that's lost between how people are trying to recommend the next generation, how to do the next best steps versus how do they see the world and what how they them, see themselves applied in it. What's the generation that comes after Gen Z? It, uh, millennials. I mean, I mean the other way, the other way. Oh, other way? Yeah. Um, I guess it's, you know, I, I'm trying to remember like the actual technical yeah. term. Is the plan it. to take your lesson learned from Gen Z and transfer it all to that, to that following generation? Well, it's actually to go ahead and go all the way across vertically. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, what do you want to do in the future is a fun question when you're asked when you're a little kid, you know, when you're first grade, kindergarten, and you're giving answers like- I mean, that. everyone wants to be a superhero, you know, yeah. fire truck worker, a policeman, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, who doesn't want to be a princess veterinarian for the zoo, you know? And so you have basically all these kids that have such like amazing imagination and like the world's their oyster but it, it kind of has different weight, that same question that's asked to them as they get older from high school to, you know, um, at, at going to entering the workforce, pivoting careers. And so realistically, you know, I actually envision us making that entire process ease across, um, across all those different chapters in one's life. But right now, again, focus on one at a time. So our focus right now is specifically Gen Z. And how many people are on your team right now? And how do you get how do you convince these people to come work for your startup for I guess basically free, I'm guessing? Yeah, that's it all started with one. Um, so I was the original crazy, um, crazy founder. Um, the one who, you know, decided to no longer uh, you know, do full time work for a corporation or for another company, but you know, decided to put their hundred percent effort into this problem area. 
and it was um it was crazy um this happened i resigned uh october 1st 2021 and by the end of that month we actually already had an initial team of five um and it you know that itself is a crazy story um it was uh, pretty wild i remember like one just meeting the next day there was five of us going into uh, a cabin in the woods in uh, California for a uh, big bear mountain that another one of our potential senior advisors said like, Hey, you know what? Some benefits to being an Eagle scout, it pays dividends. And so, but today, yeah, there's, there's eight of us and very, very, um, very, very proud and happy with the team that we have. We have engineers, uh, you know, designers, um, other people that are very involved in like PhD educated applied research for, you know, youth development and um, professional practices. So you said the statement, but you written the statement on, on social media a few times in the last week, building a public. What does that mean to you, building a public? It's being fearless. Building in public is, I, I literally think is being fearless in who you are, what your why is, and just going for it. So it's something that I would say it's after going along this journey for a year and a half now, um, you know, I, I'm not one to be shy of what I do, but to really go ahead and express that, um, I think it's something that I think is very important. So to me, it's being fearless, who you are and what you do, what's your mission. So are you going to, is your plan like the, I'm guessing you're bootstrap right now, right? Yeah. Do you plan like bootstrapping like forever? You guys want to do a fundraise? Like, how do you? What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, quite honestly, like we are in the middle of our pre-seed round. We're getting ready to do our first pilot programs in a couple of school districts and education partners right now. Um, so, you know, it's it really depends on I think how the next few months go because I really think that if our pilot programs are successful, then we might be able to. Uh, accelerate a couple of other steps without I would say the support of you know a third party investment um but at the same time if there is someone that gets involved beforehand you know we just go ahead and accelerate our our goals so Eddie how do you take care of yourself how do you make sure you don't burn out like you know before it's time or like how do you like you do take care take care of yourself you know I think it's very easy to make yourself busy all the time but i think it's so important to just recognize uh what are your priorities and what's important to you so for example um yeah i i do spend a crazy amount of time um working on future gen but i also remember um the people i care about so for example theo my dog and uh my girlfriend and my family you know i you'd be maybe surprised i call my mother um, minimally every other day, if not more frequently than that. Um, and it's just, so she knows like, you know, you know, it's, uh, she just needs that, that type of contact. And so it's, it's really, um, realizing again, what's important to you. Yeah. I think a good thing by entrepreneur, a good thing is we set our own schedule. The bad thing is we set our own schedule, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, uh, we set the pace. So how do you handle this? Like, um, it, first of all, everyone says that what they do, like they're like 100% at it, right? You're probably deluding yourself, right? You're probably not, you're probably not the best at it, right? But how do you handle like giving stuff passed off to your people, knowing they're not going to do as good as you do? Like, how do you balance that? A lot of trust. It's, it's something that you have to be disciplined in. So I would say I got some early uh, lessons in that when my early college days, when I was just fascinated by the stock market. You know, you hear the term that investors are disciplined. And so uh, at some point in time, you kind of, I want to say just invest and leave it. It's just, again, it, it's kind of the same thing with people. You can't just go ahead and just be overhead all the time on, on any particular task, especially you want to create an environment and a culture that enables growth and a healthy form of communication. And so it was something I had to um, work on. Um, and I, I would say that I, during the time from doing a lot of programs I have done from scratch, like mentorship and stuff like that in the past, I've been able to apply that with the team. And so a lot of trust, communication, sending expectations. And you know what? 
if there needs some need to be more guidance of some kind, don't be afraid to also voice that, but do it in a in a, in a way that it's it, it's a it's a growth opportunity. Talk about this. Can you talk about a time where like you, you gave something to someone and like they totally amazed you, like like you know they could do it, but like they like you expect them more like you expect them maybe C plus work, they give you like A plus work, you know. Think about a time that talk about a time that happened. Yeah, I'm thinking about our designer specifically. You know, I you know, a lot of the the MVP that's based off of initially started off as chicken scratch. You know, I had a piece of paper, I drew some stuff down. So I'm gonna like, ask people don't realize that a startup how important the designer is, right? I mean <laughs> They always say hire developers, product people, but man, like if your design sucks, like it's so important to have a good designer, like almost off the bat. It really is. And I had no idea how valuable the skill set that was until, you know, working with developers and like, well, what am I building? Um, and it's, I didn't know that either, right? Like designers, yeah. I said, we was like, tell the developer step one, step two, step three, prototype, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. I'm like, build this. It's right here. What do you mean? <laughs> what, what prototype do you mean, right? Yeah, designer is so important. Yeah, and, and so you know, speaking on her talent, um, in practice, she's actually not a designer in, in, um, in a profession, but it was something that she took up in, in college and was a passion project, and she just followed it through. And um, You're right. It's amazing how many designers are not designed, like, instead of designing college. Like, that's how most developers nowadays. Like, my dad I have now, she has a PhD in microbiology. It's actually want to do it now to develop, right? Like, yeah. I very know very few developers. I mean, they're out there. There, I very. It seems like the, the people who did not study design and development outnumber the ones that actually studied it. At least in my experience. Yeah, I mean, it's it's again, art is an expression, and some can just, I don't know, is 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 beautiful to really watch. And so again, what um, Cecilia Bill was able to do, I I, I could. I never even imagined being like the way it was. And she just like, hey, basically said, hey, this is what we want to do. Um, but I trust in your, um, you know, your capabilities. And, um, I would even be like very stubborn in some parts. And she's like, no, trust me. And it's, wow. It's, uh, it's yeah, I'm going to say, whatever you want to do, just do it. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. So like, that's, that's one example out of like, I could say almost anyone on the team. All right, so let's take a quick big break. So actually, I have to catch okay. up with Eddie. He had a few drinks before we even started. We did. We did. Surprised you uh, didn't reach for what I thought was your favorite. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of this one. Oh, you are? Yeah, remember? So this is actually my favorite, but I'm trying to go get rid of these other ones. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll help you with this other one over here. We'll save this for the, the final toast or something like that. Yeah, aren't you glad that I said my favorite bourbon was not Jack Daniels? Yeah, I'm definitely glad. Yeah, <laughs> if you're over 21 drinking Jack Daniels, yeah, you gotta you need to question yourself. <laughs> That's a good start of bourbon, I guess. Yeah, if you're in high school, whatever. Just <laughs> uh, a joke. Cheers! Thanks for doing this, Eddie. Thank so, you Eddie's my first podcast guest. Podcast guest in a while. So, this is a new setup. Trying to do some new things at the TV. In a few minutes, we're gonna have Eddie do a demo of his uh on the on the tv screen for everyone to see so next question what are some challenges you, you had to overcome so far as an entrepreneur well um so which one <laughs> yeah exactly right uh let me think of a recent one um well here is here is one that is so fun to talk about with the team so there is a word known in the startup world and i'm sure you're fairly, fairly familiar with it as well are you familiar with pivot yes oh yeah Actually, we're, that's what I'm talking, I'm talking about the later. Yeah, pivot. Let me see. Because you again. actually, you, you actually did a, you actually did a pivot, right? Done for. Done for. Okay. Yeah, over across over the course of a year and a half, it's uh, it's pretty wild. Um, you know, Future Gen was initially this tech-enabled mentorship program, and then it developed into this career compass that can fit in your pocket for college students. Then a live video streaming platform. Imagine LinkedIn and Twitch had a baby, and then we finally created this. Um, um, we reimagined, you know, what career exploration could be, and we began integrating with social media. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I would say, like, the challenges though is like, you know, you have to ask yourself. Um, it's, I think, something has to be like very, very um, normalized across startups. 
especially with first time founders, is that your first idea is probably not going to be the idea that gets you through. Um, it's a starting point. It's like a launching point, though, to springboard you to like the next series of lessons learned and insights that makes you a subject matter expert in your field and why you are the why you're the horse to back. And so it was quite interesting to go through each of these pivots and think to myself, like, you know, man, I've been doing this for, um, you know, X, Y, Z amount of time now, you know, it's, uh, people are beginning to depend on you. Like I said, like these, these people I've been working with have been something since for over a year now. And it's, um, you have a sense of responsibility. You need to make sure whenever you're making a decision, it's sound, it's not just reckless. It's not just, uh, it makes sense, not just to yourself, but um, you know, good soundboard with everyone else as well. Um, so, you know, again, our Gen Z career expression platform, we didn't publicly start broadcasting that until January of this year. And from that, I think, I think we talked, I think we have talked to maybe more than, more than 20 school districts and organizations of that eight of them showing interest in our um, pilot program. Now that five of them are the ones that are actually we're beginning to pick up and begin to really work with them. Um, so it's, it's interesting how uh, things can change just like that. So I'm gonna go back to what you said. Yeah. Like you said about how, how decisions make impact you, right? I think a lot of business owners, CEOs, entrepreneurs, case would be, they don't realize that decisions make, don't only affect the employee, but the employee's family, right? Because like, if, like you, if your company doesn't bring in sales, you have to lay people off, that affects the, your employee, the kids, you know, like, and I don't people realize that having a good enough take on that, right? Like, so how do you, like, when you make your decisions, like, take all that into, into account, right? I have to make decisions, I'm not right all the time, but like, I have to do my best moving forward in order to take care of the families who work for this, my employee. You know, it's, uh, there's this great guy local to the Pacific Northwest, uh, Dave Parker, and I had a very, very uh, great talk with him um, in one of the sessions. Like, hey, I was like, hey, you know, I, I love just, uh, love some feedback on, not what we're just working on, but on a problem that occurred or anything. And it was around the idea of that first pivot, actually, from going from the live video streaming platform side to what we're doing now. And you said to me, something that stuck with me was, you know, are you solving a problem that is getting you above the water, helps you tread above water? Because if you're solving something that still makes you below treading water, you're still drowning. So whatever you're doing, ensure that whatever you're working on keeps you up and above and keep going further. And so it's... It's when you are imagining something and people have a lot of faith in your ability and what you are imagining what a world could be, it, you have to take into consideration that not just you are treading above water, but you're able to support the people that believe in you to also go with you and get put them in a platform to, to success. So not longer just tread water, but really, really uh, stride. That's a great, great point. Um, so, how am I going to ask this question? Yeah. So, with future gen, who's your perfect customer? So, we learned that right now is probably going to be third party education groups or e learning platforms. So, you know, from our lessons learned working with school districts directly and universities, is that they can take, there's a lot of stakeholders involved. And to really build something that is potentially scalable can take, honestly, five years. But what we have learned is that with third-party uh, education groups, these are typically organizations that built relationships with school districts, schools, et cetera, for years, and already have that trust. So our ideal customers, typically, these people are entrusted to solve some of the district's biggest problems out there, and they're trying to still figure out a solution to go ahead and um, basically complement what's existing, right, in their, in their ecosystem. So recently, you did a lot of traveling, specifically in California, right, different, different business, different school districts. Yes. So to my question, why, Cal why focus on California, and why do you travel so much to meet these people in person? Well, I, I grew up in California, but I wouldn't necessarily say that's why the only sole reason. It's, uh, Yes, it's. Uh, I, I think I just know a lot of the people in California, not in terms of like a network of decision makers, but you know, I, I grew up. Um, I come from an immigrant family, 
Um, I, I know a lot of the community. I know a lot of the uh, impacts that they have gone through. I can really relate to the people there. Um, and so it's something I think every founder should do or any problem solver is you need to understand the perspective, the, the shoes of those you're trying to have an impact on. And so I understand quite well what's going on in California. And it honestly was interesting to see how universal it was when I compared it across, again, all these other um, states I was in when I did consulting for some time. Does a person's economic demographic or background matter if you use your platform? I would say, realistically, uh, no, it does not matter. But I would say right now we're putting ourselves in an um, emphasis towards risk at or at risk youth. Um, but you know, our platform can actually go ahead and serve as anyone that is, you know, from city life to um uh, those that are looking for like enrichment program. But for me again, I come from a family that, you know, we, we were low income, you know, we were uh immigrant status. Um, you know, I, I even maybe say that we came from like the rural community. So accessibility is so important to our team. And so it's something that anyone can really use. And that's something that we're very transparent about. So if someone using your platform, like pose a high school student. So who is high school students using your platform or like entry level college students or both? So, you know, it's interesting when we look at our early sign up users, again, we're, we're kind of, we're, again, we're emphasizing that we're trying to work with high schoolers right now. Okay. But if we look into our sign up list, you're seeing the .edu's. And so the, the jumping conclusion is like, oh, you're probably having college student, um, co college level or um, students that are going through college signing up for the platform as well. And so I would say that we can take care of, again, a broad range, but it's, uh, it's interesting to think about. So again, we're trying to focus on the high school experience, but it's, it's again, that problem, what do you want to do in the future? It's, it comes up again and again and again. So someone's a high school senior, they sign up your platform. From your point of view, what would be success from that person? Like, do they have to meet a certain metrics? They have to do something? Like, how does that person, like, meet success on your platform? Success to me, especially with a high schooler, kind of comes in two. There are two key things I look at. One is, is there a direct impact and, let's say, the student's motivation and classroom curriculum? So, for example... There is a there's a huge issue with um, classroom participation right now across high schools. People are a lot a lot of people were impacted by the pandemic. People are not turning in assignments. They don't know why they're learning what they're learning. They're so totally disassociated. But uh, instead of there being a uh, why am I learning the Ottoman population for penguins in the South Pole? It's like, no, it's not you're not learning that to help the penguin population. You're actually able to apply that in in business or in medicine or all these other different things. Yeah, I know Neil deGrasse Tyson that the black scientists had a good thing where people were asking like, why should I learn, you know, this geometry, this jig, this turn out all this math, right? He's like, cause I've never used it. True, you never use it, but you're missing a point. The fact you're using a part of your brain that will help you later on in life. You, you know, practice parts of your brain, you're using it that you never used before, right? And that's the, that's the purpose of learning how to do this math, right? I think a lot of people don't get that. Yeah. and. If I were going to more concisely say what I was pointing out, those two things is one, we don't think there's enough healthy communication between, let's say, a high schooler and those that are trying to really support them, like a counselor, a parent, or a mentor. And it's because there's not necessarily that environment that's in place for them to speak about their their wants, their dreams, et cetera. Um, because just imagine that you go to a high school counselor that you only see 15 minutes every three months. You're going to open up and be like, I want to no. be this or that? No. no. And so, Especially if you're a high school student. No. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I have a good story. It's not. It's actually a bad story, right? So one time I went to my niece's graduation, high school graduation a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was like, you know, first person, 3.9 grade point average, scholarship to this college. Next person, 3.7. Like 10 people walked by, like high grade point average, for academic scholarships. Then my niece, 3.8. Community college, like. What what's going on, right? Like, like what's going on? And then you know they oh like the counselor never helped her out. Did she go to the counselor? You know, so like, how do all these people get scholarships? And you have the same grade point average. You go to community college. Like, what am I missing here, right? So yeah, 
So is, is that on the parents, on the student, it's on the counselor, like, you know? Yeah, so again, there's like two big impacts. It's again, a lot of parents don't even know how their child really- I mean, because you didn't go to college, how do you know how to get your kids in college, right? Yeah, exactly. And so that was a, you know, a big reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now is because, you know, my parents, I think they gave me uh, what I needed to be successful. They, they at least gave you a fighting chance. Yeah, they, they uh, something they did well was helped me to explore my interests. And so they may have not been, you know, gone to degrees or anything like that, but they said like, you know, be who you are, go for that. We'll figure it out from there. And so, you know, they may have said Eddie after high school, go to college and they may not know how to uh, really navigate college, but they, again, parents are on your, on your corner. They're in your corner. They're rooting for you. And they may not always know how, but they'll cheer you on. (laughs) Most teenage kids, like, I don't agree with that statement. (laughs) You don't think so? I mean, most teenage kids will probably say that. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's I don't weird. agree with that statement. Yeah, it's, it's not until after you leave the house, usually, <laughs> where you realize, yeah. like, wow, you know, you know who was, like, you know, cooking me dinner every night? You know who was, like, making sure that my laundry was folded? You know. So for your point of view, what is the purpose of college? Because some people will say it's to get you a job. Some people say it's to get you, get you to think. Other people say it's to like, build up social networks. From your point of view, what is the purpose of college? I think it's honestly a tool. Um, it's a place for you to grow. And it's like any tool, there's a way to properly use it and there's a way to misuse it. And so if you go in there with, like, you know, um, kind of, again, a goal, then it's it can be very, very purposeful. Um, but sometimes I would say it's, especially like when you're 18, uh, 17 sometimes, making a decision like, hey, that could impact your whole life. It's it's very very uh, easy to uh, make a decision maybe with uh, the wrong, or maybe not the best intent. Unfortunately. So I can't think of his name, but one of the talk show hosts, the one with the red hair, can't remember his name. But uh, he, Ron Weasley. No, sorry. No, no not him. No, no. He used to be on TBS, but uh, he actually graduated from Harvard, right? And he, he was an interview talking about how he went to Harvard or whatever. And, like, how's he going to Harvard? Like, he said, like, I knew I was the dumbest kid there, right? You know, I didn't care because my degree it just says my name. It doesn't say dumbest kid of Harvard. It says Harvard degree, right? Yeah. I thought that that's a good like outlook to have, right? Like you have this degree. Now, having said that, do you think it matters what college you go to? I mean, of course, I'm guessing if you go to Harvard versus you know North Dakota Technical Institute, you know, might be a difference. But is it really different between Stanford and Harvard and University of Texas and Texas Tech and Washington State? You know, I would say, unfortunately, yes. I, I personally don't like the reasons for it. I mean, I've experienced it myself. I mean, I I went to UC Davis, which is a world-renowned school for environmental sciences and um, and also veterinary sciences. But outside of that, um, not not so much. And so I remember that uh, one of my biggest decisions in life was to either go to um, uh potentially, you know, continue my, my profession in the San Francisco area or go to Southern California and start from scratch. And so when I did that, I ended up going to Southern California and starting my whole career from scratch down there. Again, no network, no nothing. And I realized how important and how uh, that school name could be because uh, in Southern California, the schools that dominate are UC San Diego, UCLA, USC, uh, for all the opportunities that I was looking for, but no one's going to bat an eye at uh, a school that is in Northern California. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't like it. It's just what it is. It is yeah. So growing up in California, did you grow up in like a like big city environment or like a rural country environment? I kind of had an interesting flavor of different places. So I grew up in Southern California in uh, the outskirts of the greater Los Angeles area. Think of like Pomona, um, I grew up specifically in Ontario, which is actually San Bernardino County, but it's uh, again that like that cross border there. Um, but I grew up there until I was about ten, and then my family moved to Northern California to Monterey County, and it was a huge transition to I thought what dark was I, I, like a creepy alley to oh there's no light in this you know tar road oh my god are are these are there monsters in the dark <laughs> I could believe it. Um, so it was, it was a, again, country boy kind of 
uh, I grew up as a uh, as a city boy, but grew up in the country as well. So you mentioned this a little bit ago, but they talk about this on like people are talking about accessibility, right? We usually talk about you know like rich versus poor, black versus white, you know. But I think a bigger one is like city versus rural, right? Because you know if you're in the city, Seattle, San Francisco, you're gonna have access to the internet, all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. not the same in like you know you know rural areas, right? A lot of rural areas have no internet at all, right? Like. I mean, I remember my peers, they had high speed internet and I was still using, I was still going to the library to write my book reports. And that was like, I think high speed internet existed for at least four or five years. Get to the- four or five years, sorry. No way. Yeah, and I, I know like Elon Musk doing a lot, doing this like, what's it called, Space Link or Starlink, whatever it's called. Yeah, I think it's Starlink. And there's like using net, you know, but yeah, a lot of, you know, if you live in the country, like you really have no internet. And it's such a disadvantage, I think. Yeah, it's again, especially when you're a youth, you only know what you know. Mm-hmm. And so if you're only if you grew up just around corn mazes, then uh, or cornfields, like what, how can you imagine anything different? I mean, one of the school districts that we're having um, trying to launch a pilot program is in southern Illinois, I think is uh, Mount Vernon High School. And they, uh, I literally called them up and called them up and said, like, you know, what are the kind of opportunities that are kind of local to the area? And they mentioned, there's cornfields, you can work in a tire manufacturing site, and there's a body farm. And often all the time them get, what's a body farm? <laughs> what is a body farm? It's, uh, think of it as like for forensic purposes. Okay. So um, that, you know, maybe like they're trying to like investigate, like, you know, there's a homicide or something like that. They maybe will test the decomposition um, of, you know, certain scenarios. So I'm going to throw a random question that came out ahead. What's up? Who's your favorite Spider-Man? Uh, Tobey Maguire, the other guy, or Tom Holland? I like I said, the other guy. Andrew oh, Garfield. Andrew uh, Garfield, that's it. Andrew yeah, Garfield, yeah. Guy. No, it's I can't uh, remember, remember his name. Tobey Maguire, man. He's kind of yeah. like, he's the OG. Yeah, and uh, Garfield, he got a lot of shit at first, but now I think more people appreciate his performance, you know? At first, he first came like, man, this you're a horrible Spider-Man. Like, this is crap. But now I think more people like really appreciate his performance, you know? Yeah, I mean, he's a. Uh, each of them have like their own different, uh, again, greater twist mm-hmm. to the character, and uh, all of them fall under the Spider Man's theme. Yeah, and universe. So um, I like Andrew Garfield personally. Um, you know, but Toby is OG. Like he, yeah, he definitely bought it the light. Like yeah, he's my childhood man. He's yeah. like, yeah. And uh, from and then from like um, so Andrew, he his he didn't have a Mary Jane. Andrew had Gwen Stacy, right? Yeah. So the two Mary Janes and Gwen, which one do you like the best? Which one do you think was the best performer? Or whatever you want oh, to okay. characterize it, you know, like. Okay, I'm like, if I'm thinking like, of like, like comics. You, you, you got your best Spider-Man, which one is your best, you know, I guess best girl, Spider's girlfriend. Well, you know, if I'm speaking just specifically on the um, theater, um, I, I will always have a bias towards MJ mm-hmm. um, because. The, the first one? Yeah, the first yeah. one, because that's like, that's the original. How, how can yeah. like outbeat the originals? And like, I, I know Gwen Stacy is cool and all that. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm, I'm with the Zendaya one. I just like her personality, her darkness. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like her like yeah. her personality. Yeah, with her. Yeah, I remember I had this, uh, this Spider-Man like encyclopedia book and it talked about all the girlfriends that Spider-Man had and um you know Gwen Stacy he, he didn't do bad you know for you know skinny chump high school student you know like he didn't do half bad no no you gotta give him some credit yes and you're also a big Star Wars fan too right I am I am um I would say that I don't know if you're anybody's watching the Mandalorian season three is I just watched the first episode well the second one's out but it's oh, okay yeah so you got some catching up to do my friend yeah I know I can't wait till they do the Ahsoka series Oh yeah, that's coming up too. Yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, there was a, a love hate transition between uh, you know when Disney, um, yeah, got their hands involved. I know, right? It's like man, those I don't know those last Star Wars movies. I don't know. Like I'll say it out loud, the Last Jedi. That that's, that's to me that's a complete trash, right? It's like it's, to me it's horrible. I know a lot of people like it. Now I, I did love the fight scene with um Ray and um. Yeah, and what's that guy's name? Kylo, Kylo Ren. Yeah. When he killed uh, Snook, and then they fought those Emperor guards. You know, that's a badass scene. I did like that. Yeah, but then you go into Rogue One, and Darth Vader has like oh that goodness. thirty second scene. You're like, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I almost fucked up and walked out before that scene. What? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you. Did. I-, I thought this is over with. You know, I'm like, I thought you're glad you did. Oh, yeah, I'm that. so glad. Yeah. 
Yeah. No. And of course, every Star Wars fan is waiting and begging for like the actual Darth Vader movie, right? Like, but oh yeah, but they'll probably never make it because that'd be too dark. Have you ever read? You ever read in the books? I read a handful of them. So there's a book called Dark Lord Rising. It talked mm. about uh, Vader from the time from when Obi Wan jacked him up. Yeah, yeah. Like his first three years, like how he was killing Jedi, doing this stuff. It's, it's pretty like how he got dark and stuff. Yes, yeah, it's a pretty good book. If they made that to a movie, that'd be right on time. But who knows? You know, I again, as long as they do it right, as long as they have, um, I forgot who was the director. Um, oh, I need to talk about. Um, was it John? Not John first. That's someone else. Um, I know you're talking about. Yeah. He's it. the one that made a joke. Like he had to go to the hospital because he broke his back carrying Star Wars on his shoulders, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing I'd give Disney credit for, they they seem to get Darth Vader correct, right? Because they got him right in Rogue One. They got the Darth Vader series right, you know? At least my point of view, right? Yeah. Everything else, I don't know. Yeah. Again, it was, uh, again, I was the fan that my dad, um, when the, so you had the original trilogy, mm. then you had the like the pre-trilogy, yeah. um, and then you got to like the uh, the the newer Disney ones. Yeah. And so my dad would take me to theaters um, with the the prequel, and so I would uh you know I, I was just such a fan. I just remember like staying like you know as late at night and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, but then so when they made the announcement with the newest trilogy you could just i was ecstatic i was yeah. just like this is oh my god this is good. i'm gonna live my dream man uh, i'm gonna relive it and so i remember that year i don't dress up for halloween but <laughs> i ended up getting a costume under for my favorite character in star wars han solo and i i went all out so i like i got like the, the good like fitted costume and all that and I'm like, no, I'm going to be probably wearing this more than once. So this is like a good investment, you know? And so I remember driving from um, near Sacramento, California, all the way to Southern California um, to watch this new movie with my siblings and my cousins. And I knew within like the first five or like 10, 15 minutes Maybe. that it was going to be like, no, yeah, they did not. And then, you know, then they killed Han Solo. Yeah. And I was like, was that a movie where they spent like 30 minutes running through casinos and stuff? Uh, they spent 30 minutes wrong in many different places. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you ever watch the, the clone, the animated cartoon series, The Clone Wars? Yeah. No. To me, I, that to me, like, that was like way better than any of the Disney movies. Yeah. To me, it tied in like, you know, from New Hope to Revenge of the Sith, like, perfectly. Yeah, it's there's some good stuff on there. They said dark. I mean, and he started going dark. The stuff he was doing, you know, like you know, like force choking people and stuff. You know, you okay? I can tell how he's going, like dead on the wrong path. Yeah, it's again. Uh, there's a lot of realization. Again, there's a lot of lessons that are taught in yeah. the George Lucas world, there, Star Wars universe, and uh, you know, a lot of people get just excited about the you know the lightsaber scenes, but I was like, well, what's the way behind the yeah the build up? Do you think he regrets selling off to Disney? Like, man, I was going to have that, what's it, $5 billion back? You know, it's a, uh, I, I personally, I mean, that's a lot of money a to turn Strong down. believer of, uh, yeah, it is. Um, a strong believer of living a life of um, not having regrets. Yeah. And what ifs are, have a particular weight to them. I wouldn't be surprised if he had like a what if scenario. Yeah. Like, what kind of ideas did he have? Like, man, I would have done this, I would have done that, you know, like, so. Uh, Somebody posted on Facebook a long time ago. They, they basically said, I'm a Star Wars fan, but I'm tired of the Skywalker stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Let's do a Star Wars. You go back in time when, like, there's no rule of Sith of two. Like, there's, like, hundreds of Sith, tons of Jedi, the old Republic, and do a movie about that, right? So, man, that'd be a pretty cool idea. That'd be pretty cool. I love their comics about it. Like, Knights of the Old Republic and all that. Cool. So, let's back to some startup stuff for fast. <laughs> while you're geeking out. Um, so, we talk about your challenges. How do in how do you convince someone to come on with you? Like, I think I might have asked you that before, but like, how do you, maybe we can rephrase that. What kind of values do you want someone to have that works for you? Well, you have to have a love for the same problem area. So again, when I did, when I was- And, and how do you figure that out? Yeah, so what I did to find those people out is, uh, again, I, I had this, you know, this really thick Eagle Scout book. Again, it's like literally right there. I still carry it with me. Um, and I actually just reached out and I said, hey, I. I'm looking for some feedback on what I think is a real problem. Um, can I borrow some of your time? And so in doing that, I ended up 
talking to, uh, honestly, finding my team, actually. Um, and when I realized that I was having like very fruitful discussions with individuals, I would then, uh, you know, at some point just pull the trigger and just not be shy about it. And so it was, uh, again, you have to have a love for the, the problem area you guys are trying to solve for. And again, not in a solution, but in the problem area. And so in doing that, I was actually able to find people in the corner, in our corner. So how do you, so we all say I'm busy, I'm busy, but how do you personally switch from being this busy to actually being productive? I think it's the 80-20 rule is very, very applicable in many scenarios. And I also include being a founder because, for example, yes, there is a lot of like, you know, planning across the, uh, your team, talking to your developers, talking to designers, talking to your marketing side. And, you know, facilitating all that together, you know, getting the applied research into the product. But what is like the 20% of, uh, let's say, effort they can do that 80% of people would really care about? Let's say closing a customer. If you just close the customer or, you know, you were able to do a successful uh, closing, like let's say with an investor, heck, you know, people are going to be like, you can still be doing all this busy movement and stuff like that. But people are going to be like, that, that was some really good activity there. So you got to really think about the activity that again uh, push the needle forward. What's a skill that you're like decent at, but you wish you could get better at? That you need to work on and make yourself better at this skill. Probably time, probably time management. Um, again, I uh, I would say I can do better in terms of prioritizing that eighty twenty. Um, so, for example, I can uh, start up world. There's different uh, priorities throughout the entire day. But there should probably should be some core tasks that you should diligently always be making progress with. And so I would say, again, uh, when you're trying to build a relationship with investors, that's not like a one-day thing. That's an ongoing thing. When you're building a relationship with customers, that's not a one-time thing. That is an all-the-time thing. And so you can easily find yourself distracted with all these other things that are just screaming for your name. But you got to remember to go back to again those those very core principles. And how long have you been in Seattle so far? A little more than a year. I moved here, I think, in February last and year. And you've been involved with the the startup scene since you got here, right? Um, sorry, Sam. You've time? been involved with the tech startup since you got here, right? Yeah, I mean, that's this is where I would definitely say I put my my all in. And before that, it was maybe five months. So, from your experience. From you here, what are some pros and cons about the Seattle tech, tech, tech up scene? I think, again, every question a founder should ask themselves is, are you in a city that truly inspires you to innovate? And so for Seattle, it did it for me. And so there's a lot of things I love about Seattle. So, for example, um, the city has their own pace, and Seattle specifically, I think is a lot more uh, close-knit, but in a way that I personally like. Like, for example, I don't like the question, oh, what do you do? To be the first thing after, like, not even knowing who your name is. Um, and I don't get that um, vibe here in Seattle. It's a conversation. Yeah, you do get into those little talks, but, you know, after at least five minutes of getting to know who you are and stuff like that, getting a sense. Um, I would say the, the breach or I would say the barrier to get access to the startup ecosystem is a little bit elevated here, but it's not impossible to go through. Like, for example, I have no work here in Seattle, but I would say that I'm probably not an unfamiliar name to a lot of the people involved in the startup Pacific Northwest ecosystem. You have to make an effort, right? Yeah. I think a lot of people like make an attempt. Oh, I emailed someone, so they never responded, so I give up, right? You got to, you know. You gotta put yourself out there and like, you know, like you said, build in public, like you like to say. Yeah, you gotta reach out a bit more. And I would say like in San Francisco, the Bay Area, you probably don't have to do it as much because they're, that ecosystem is kind of built in place to support that. Here, you just gotta reach a little further, not like, you know, breaking your back kind of way, but there is a healthy, uh, healthy uh, ecosystem that's here. Talk about the importance of networking for entrepreneurs. Well, let me praise that. Probably the parts of net, networking, however, the comma, you still have to like build your product, right? So how do you do that balance? Meeting people, building your product, you can't do all of it, right? 
No, I think there's a lot of truth to your, your net worth is your net worth. Um, and I would say, don't take it in the way of like, hey, surround yourself by, you know, the, the rich and the famous, but it's actually across so many different spectrums. Like, for example, I'm trying to build something that is in education. So my network with, amongst educators is very valuable. Um, not just network with investors. Um, or, um, again, knowing, uh, your network is your net worth it, is there's so many different verticals of that. So I would say I have a different web, um, of people with, within the startup community versus the investor community versus the educator community versus the software tech community versus, uh, you know, it's there, there, again, there's just so many different ways to, uh, really apply that. So talk about this, how you deal with hearing no. You can hear no, probably. You talk to 100 investors, you probably hear no not, at least 99 times. If you sell your product, you probably hear no half the time. You, as an entrepreneur, you hear no over and over again, right? Talk about how you personally deal with hearing no without like, like mentally breaking you. It's, uh, I think with every no, gets you closer to it. Yes, there's probably a reason behind the no. Under, so listen, listen carefully to why that no is there. Um, and you can learn a lot from that. Again, uh, uh, a victory isn't done overnight. It's, it's or a triumphant of many, many small wins. And so even in loss, there is win. Through a no, there is a lesson. With a no, there is a way to grow further, to reach um, feedback, to reach further. Eddie, what's your red line? Like what, this, this happened, you're going to stop, right? Where, where that may be, maybe like you, your savings account goes to zero or like so what, what's your red line? So I think it's important to founders have a red line when they know me, they didn't stop. Like my red line mm -hmm. is, and my wife put it for me, we, we can't, I can't touch a house, right? I can't do a HELOC, I can't do a second mortgage. That's my red line. So what would it be your red line? Two years. Two years is my red line. Does that give you enough time though? Um, you know. And, and when does that two year start though? So I had, uh, I was a part of this entrepreneurial academy um, back in 2020. And as I was giving a presentation on the earliest iterations of Future Gen, um, I caught the attention of a couple of VCs in the Sacramento SF area. And uh, I unfortunately did not win that academy, but they took me to the side and said, hey, Eddie, you should have won that competition hands down. Not even, not even, there shouldn't have not even been a close second. And they asked me, like, so what was the problem? You know, why, why is it, uh, why are the, there are these challenges that you're experiencing? And I was saying like, you know, I'm a consultant full time, you know, that 80 hour a week thing is very real. There's a lot of different competing interests. And so when something is not your focus, it's hard to really go ahead and apply a lot of lessons learned and cash on the details, et cetera. So the, um, the VC, one of the VC guys, I think his name is, is John, I remember his last name. He pulled me in the side and said, Eddie, you know what? Spent two years on this and just give it your all. See where that takes you. I promise you, you'll go so much further and you read it. So that two-year journey began October 1st, 2020 okay. and, or 2021. Yeah. 22. Two? Yeah, two. Sorry. The last year, right? This is definitely the second year. It's 21, 21. So, so you're saying you have until October? Yeah, I technically have until October of this year. That's, that's, that's like a weekend away if you think about it. Yeah, but we pivoted four times. We have these pilot programs that are in place. We actually have some big contracts that are in, in talks in California right now. So October um, comes, where do you have to be at to keep on going? Like a certain number of revenues, a number of customers, like where do you have to be at for you to keep on going? I think there has to be a milestone that's met for us to go to the next stage. Okay. So I consider us right now we're you know pre-revenue or at this MVP stage. Well, I think to me what indicates keep going is you are able to go ahead and get, get investment for the next round, or you're able to go ahead and have customers that are coming back. Um, so it's it's something that I think either of those two things if they're satisfied, then I'm like, whoa. You know, I we did a lot in two years. Um, there, there is more fuel in the tank. So, what is the um, 
who actually pays for your product? So, um, in terms of like who the customer is? Yeah, like who, who actually pays you the money? So, there's two. So, one is actually the parent of the child that is trying to figure themselves out. The second is, again, um, is indirectly school districts, but school districts that pay for usually a third party um, uh, interest group that then pays us. So like, for example, there's this contract in California that we're pursuing where it's for a uh, statewide implementation for apprenticeships. So they won the contract from the state and they're trying to look for a technological solution to help them augment their, um, you know, their goal. And so we're being seen as potential uh, um, platform. So Eddie, are you, a, I'm gonna get this term wrong probably, are you like first generation or second generation immigrant? I'm a first generation. First generation? Yeah. Can you talk about that story? Like, you know, like the, I, I hate to say they were pros and cons, like, you know, like some rewards of being a first generation immigrant, like some challenges, like the, the, all that deep dive in that. Yeah. So I'd say like how my family ended up here in the States, there's actually two different, two different takes. Um, so speaking of my mother specifically, she comes from Ecuador. And so there was a potential opportunity that her family believed that they were going to get, that she was able to get here in the United States. Um, so unfortunately though, things did not go as planned when she did come into the States. And and she came here by, by herself? Or she, yeah, she, came, she came here by herself. Uh, I think she was around like 10 or 11, maybe 12. Um, Ecuador is, is, people don't know it's in South America, like top of South America, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, think of it, it's on the equator, Ecuador, the equator. It, I, I can remember, I think Ecuador is like one of the top 10 countries, like, you know, American retires to go live. When they retire, I think it's like one of those top country. I definitely know they sell a lot of roses for Valentine's Day <laughs> uh, for here in the States. Um, they also, if you look in the grocery store, you'll know it's probably a lot of bananas. So your mother came all the way by herself. Yeah. I'm guessing like, I'm guessing she didn't have a last flight from Ecuador to like Texas, right? She probably had to walk the whole way or something, I'm guessing. Or uh, I think she's going on a plane. Plane, okay. Uh, but she went with another family. Okay. That other family it promised her. Um, some things and unfortunately you know it's some things were oversold the old baiting switch problem yeah now when it came to uh, my father's side so my father is technically a first generation for his family um but um so his story is along on my like, no, my last name again it comes if said in spanish is Masariagos, it comes from spain and um uh, we spent a lot of time in guatemala so his family immigrated from Guatemala to the States. So they were, they were impacted by the, the I think the civil war conflict that was ongoing there. Yeah. Um, and what are some like, um, how do I word this? Hmm. Advantages of being an immigrant or disadvantages? You know, that's, that's actually the first time I've been asked the question that way. The advantages of being an immigrant. Because um, some would say, you know, most immigrants are more hardworking. They preach the American dream more. You know, they're they're like all in. You know, where most Americans are like, yeah, I'm not going to work at McDonald's. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. You know, where most immigrants are like, oh, I'm going to take the opportunity and make the most of it. You know, no matter how small it is. I think something I've learned is that we're very, very adaptable. Um, whatever the scenario is, so I, I think uh, that's an advantage that I've been able to leverage. Um, it's, uh, you know, with every problem, there's an opportunity. Um, I would say oftentimes being multilingual is a great benefit as well. Um, being able to speak, you know, English and let's say uh, Spanish business profession is like very, 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 very uh, good to have. Um, I would say another big advantage too would maybe be um, you value, you, you definitely value um, things have a certain a greater weight, I think, than I would say if you were just if it wasn't earned, it was like already like a ob not obligation, but uh, just already given. Yeah, most Americans already given everything, you know. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, there there's a there's a way to say it and all that, but it's like you know, it's like for example, uh, money to me was like. Uh, I remember like when I opened up a bank account, I was like, oh my gosh, this is my first account. Oh my gosh, all my money's in there. I was like, it was, I was so proud of it. I'm like, I'm earning, I'm earning interest. Like I didn't know about inflation all that. I was like, oh my God. You didn't realize you actually lose the money. Yeah. 
um versus like uh, i remember another good friend of mine um he he's like oh you don't you have only that much in your account my family puts this in my account yeah. and so i'm like cool and so let's suppose you met someone tomorrow and they're like 18 years old and they say, hey, you know, I just came here from, I'm a new immigrant. I just got here yesterday. And like, I know nothing. I'm here with my parents. Like we're trying to figure stuff out. What advice should you have for them? You know, I would say it's a, uh, this is a very important time for you to have an honest reflection who you are, because especially right now in your new place, you're going to want to blend in, but it there comes a point to uh, blending in may not be the best. Um, I would say really. But sometimes you need to stand out, right? Yeah, but it's just know who you are. What kind of person you want to be? Like, what is who? Uh, just know that the decisions that you're making right now. Can you go back to your ten year old self and be look at him and have that ten year old look up to you, be proud of who's who he's going to become, he or she's going to become. So it's a uh, you know, your decisions have an impact. And I know that it's, especially when you're new, you just want to just, there's like a lot of acceptance that's wanted. But believe it or not, wherever you go, you being you, there are going to be people that they love you for being you. So have you found like being an immigrant has given you advantage like over like regular Americans? Like, have you seen these, how like, have you like compare yourself to, hey, to compare yourself, like you're you, an immigrant, you, regular American, like man, I have so much more focus, so much more drive than this person does. Are you, are you think everything's evenly balanced? I don't know if I probably didn't word that correctly. Mm, I mean, it's, are you find yourself having more drive than most other people around you? I guess I know my friends definitely would. They would probably say, Oh my God, Eddie, like you overachiever or something like that. But I don't see it that way personally. You know, I see it more as like most uh, overachievers don't. <laughs> I'm just like, I, I'm doing this because I care about it. <laughs> Um, but you know, most of my friends would be like, oh my God, Eddie, you know, if anyone was going to build a startup, it was going to be you. Um, so it's, it's interesting to think of it in that way. Um, I, I also never really saw uh, a lot of the advantages slash disadvantages. Yeah, I just I, saw I, myself yeah. as like, hey, I think, I think there's advantages to disadvantage to everything, right? Yeah. Where you're in life, there's an advantage to disadvantage to everything. Yeah. So you take advantage of the advantage more than you than the disadvantage of taking a disadvantage of you, I think. I feel like I could have taken more advantage if I would have embraced my identity more. Mm -hmm. I personally was a little bit I don't say I was shameful of my um, you know, being Hispanic or anything mm -hmm. like that, but I didn't want to be given handouts. Yeah. Like I wanted it because I earned this. It wasn't because of the color of my skin I was able to get these achievements or get these opportunities presented to me. Um, but to be frank, I think if I was, you know, in, uh, if I can somehow give that advice to like, I'd be like, Hey, you know what, to be honest, they're there for a reason. Um, these are people in your corner. Uh, um, they want to help you. And you're, you're, you're doing your pre seed fundraise right now, right? Yeah. I mean, of course you can't tell all the details of the six what you're doing, but can you tell us the overall plan for your fundraise? Like you have a certain group of investors you're reaching out to, or you don't hear Seattle, the Bay area, like, are you only reaching out to like, obviously only reach out to a tech investor, but what's your, like your schematic for that, so to speak? Yeah. So I would say the kind of realm that we fall under is, yeah, education technology, also future of work, also a bit of a uh, long-term play, play HR. Um, you know, uh, I, I can speak more on that, how, how that's related, but um, I would say it's again, more of those pre-seed type of uh, funds, seed funds. Although it's also very important to also make these relationships with those series A and beyond. Um, yeah, you're or, right. I think a lot of people miss importance, right? You know, you're, you're doing pre C, but you still got to build relationship for A and all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. You don't want to be fundraising with new people tomorrow. You want people to have this trust in you over time. And off the top of your head, how many investors have you talked to so far? Oh. Like this is SMX. Mm. That's a, uh, I had a guess, probably at least around a hundred in the sense of like having a discussion. hundred, that's a good number. So the hundred, like what percentage do you think, or like interest is, eight, what percent, like, man, I, I wasted my time talking to this guy, you know, can you break those percentages down? I would say, I, I wholesomely believe like maybe 10% of those are ones that I would, I feel like these are really good fits. These are people That's, that's actually a pretty to. high number. That's um, good. Yeah, but for like different things, like. I 
I think there'd be different priorities, uh, different stages. So like, for example, you want to make sure that um, where you're working with probably has the appropriate network for like, let's say education, or again, with at-risk youth, or again, like later on road, um, roads, but um, it's, uh, again, you got to like look at where you are today, mm -hmm. find where you're going to want to go tomorrow. Because um, again, some funds only support up to yeah. the seat. Here's one for you. So when I first started this, people would say, you know, like, if you talk to an investor and you pitch them and they say no, like, don't ask them for an introduction, right? Because like, like, why would they introduce you to a friend of theirs if they didn't invest you, right? Then I learned a thing about dry powder, right? So, so maybe like, they, they didn't invest because they're, they're, they dry powder. Dry powder is like the money they have left to invest in like funds, right? Or maybe they don't invest in that, right? But lots of ideas, right? I just said so many people saying, oh, to ask for intro, I'm like, why not ask for intro? Because you don't know why they didn't invest you. I mean, maybe they tell you, maybe they don't, but like, I always thought that was a bad advice when I got early in my startup career, so to speak, right? Don't, don't ask for introduction to someone who tells you no. Like, hmm. you know, like, like you're an investor. I come talk to you and like, man, Jason, I'm not gonna invest with you. I do research, like, you can't invest because like, you have no money left to invest, right? Why not ask the intro? I just think, I just think so many people give wrong advice on that. This is my opinion. I I think you'd be, uh, there's a, actually a lot of respect that's given between, that's given by uh, an investor when a founder is not afraid to ask for something. I so, agree. for example, like a lot of the people that have been telling me that, oh, we're, you're not ready now, um, come back later. I'll be like, well, okay, well, this is what I'm looking for now. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in your, uh, that you can recommend reaching yeah. out to? Because it also puts them on a test. Yeah. It puts them like, how good is your network? How exactly. connected are you? And so it becomes an exercise for them. Yeah. And it gives you a little bit of a taste like what it could potentially be. It's a two-way street, you know? Yeah. Like, most exactly. people don't realize that. Of course, you know, it is like leaning towards them a lot because like most founders can barely get one investor, you know, and they got to take it, so to speak, you know. But a lot of founders like, you know, they'll have like four or five term sheets, right? And then, you know, which one do you pick? You know, it's hopefully the has to be with someone again that you you can see yourself working with for a long time. Yeah, definitely. I think the stats show like you're with your your VC person longer than most people are married nowadays. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, <laughs> that that says that. See, most marriages are now average like eight years, and like your VC is gonna last like at least ten years for you. Man, double digits. Yep. So you better like make sure you like that person, you know, and get along, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it really depends on the thesis of the fund. Yes, um, that's a good point too. Pieces of fun. That's that's a good point. Um, so what would you take for you not to have someone invest in you? Like suppose like you met someone and they want to invest in you. What would it be like, you know, like for you not to say yes? Like, okay, like either you didn't like this person or like the values didn't align with you. Like I think uh I have to know why they're investing. Mm -hmm. Um so for again, I think a very good uh reason to be for me to say no is I I don't really want investor money that I would say is like where they have a dead presence in the sense that, oh, here's cash cow, mm -hmm. take my money. I, I think you have a great vision and all that. Um, because it's, I, I really want to work with someone that is, uh, provides more value than just the cash. Uh, again, as a first time founder, especially, there is probably a lot of learning opportunities through someone that is able to give insight on terms of their experience. Um, so not saying like I expect the investor to work for me, um, but again, I do believe guidance would go a long way. Good point. Um, so next we're gonna try something I haven't done before here at the podcast. <laughs> so as you see, I have the TV screen set up. We're gonna actually have Eddie do a demo of his product real fast and see how this works. Yeah, so uh, I'm a little excited too. Nervous, but excited, you know. This is a... Uh... So I'll be here on this other screen, you just give me direction. Yeah, so I, I guess to give a little intro, so again, our uh, future gen is this Gen Z career exploration platform for high schoolers. What we do is essentially is we show students their interests applied in the world around them using social media videos. And then we share these insights with parents, teachers, counselors to help them guide their students with the next best steps to continue to explore their innate interests. And so 
This is one of our models that we're putting together for some one of our upcoming pilot programs. It's typically what we show school districts and decision makers before um, they decide whether or not they want to take the next steps with us. So with that, Jason, I'm going to ask you to skip some of this boring stuff. So right here is um, actually just like a little screenshot of the um, of our website. Um, so please click. And you know, there's some sign up information and stuff like that, but this isn't where the cool stuff really is. So imagine that you signed up, Jason, um, click through, and you are now an admin user and you're gonna get ready to send your invitation to a student user. Um, please select again. And this is the next step here is where things get cool. So um, I don't know if anybody here has ever done a, uh, like a career assessment where you answer a couple of questions and then it says, hey, based on your answers, you should be a plumber, an accountant, a, uh, you know, a lumberjack or something like that. Well, our team hates them. <laughs> um, we believe people are way more dynamic. Uh, you know, what do you want to do in the future is more about uh, self-discovery. So how do you enable that? And so this is where some of our um, ways of reimagining what this fun alternative career assessment can look like. And so uh, next slide, please. And so imagine that there is a platform that is able to go ahead and instead of asking you questions like, hey, what is the, how great is your reading comprehension? Um, instead you're watching videos um, that goes over, let's say business or healthcare or law and public safety um, to get rid of the gr grammatical context that can cause confusion to students. Um, and basically, basically we are able to measure their interests. Next slide. And so what you end up seeing is actually uh, an example of something like this, which is uh, a student that is maybe looking through the uh, healthcare services section and they're seeing a clip from YouTube, TikTok, Instagram Reel. And in that, they're actually able to get an actual idea of what healthcare services looks like without actually being asked so what do you think about becoming a doctor? So uh, next slide. And so after a student goes through a series of videos, eventually they get prompted this question, like how, how well did you like these collection of videos? Um, or what do you think about healthcare services after this? And so we're actually able to, again, measure their engagement on how much they liked or disliked or watch time and whether or not they actually gave us a hard yes or no on whether or not they had an interest in the area. And so, uh, next slide. And so we do this across a large breadth of industries. Um, so communication, transportation, this here is education. And after they have gone through um, um, the initial 10 categories that we have, they get a, a snapshot of the results. So next slide, please. This is an example of one. So this student here, this is probably like very, very small to everybody, but um, top right hand side demonstrates uh, industries that a student has said they really have a strong interest with, um, how much watch time and how much uh, they engage positively with the series of videos that they're watching. And so with this, you're then able to show this to a counselor who is then able to say like, oh, it looks like this person loved communication. Um, let's go ahead and um, let the student know about the opportunities to continue exploring communications on the platform or um, it, within the school's resources. Like maybe there is a good um, media photography course that the student was unaware of that um, they can take an opportunity, um, opportunity with. And so, that's, that's kind of this in a tiny nutshell. Um, it's an opportunity again for the student to explore their interest. And the past this point, they're able to look at the, um, you know, uh, career possibilities, educational possibilities, and skills that are very valued across an interest. And you know, down the road, we're hearing uh, that there's interest in like maybe putting this in in the classroom, right? Like let's say, uh, you know, a biology teacher to go ahead and express 
you know, what are the opportunities in biology that you can find in the classroom? And so they can go ahead and help their students engage more with the curriculum. But yeah, that's a, thank you so much for the opportunity there. Yeah, so I don't really know if that showed up on the TV screen or not, I'm gonna have to check it out. I could definitely get, but we're definitely sending a demo out to people who ask for it. But I definitely yeah. got to make that better, yeah. But thanks for that demo, Eddie. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions or would even want access to an early version of this, um, please let me know. You can find me on uh, on LinkedIn. We have a website, futuregenxyz.com. Uh, Sorry for that shameless plug there, No, Jason. no, but you're going to get plenty of opportunities to plug yourself in a minute. <laughs> so, Eddie, um, what, what do you – so – Besides, you know, your, your, your relationship with your dog, if you, you take your dog to the dog park for fun, what other things do you do for fun? I go outside. Outside? <laughs> You're an outside person? I, I am. Uh, as a Boy Scout, I did get that green foot. So I have my camping gear that I still have from Boy Scout days that probably should get replaced. But I invested in great equipment. Um, so, yeah, I, I do uh, camp quite a bit. So you're definitely a good place for camping being outside in this area. Yeah, although I would say I don't like camping in the rain necessarily. I like to be a little drier. Yeah, there's there's that right. <laughs> no, that that actually brings, reminds me of a funny story. If you don't mind me sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so believe it or not, in California, um, my preferred way of camping was not with a tent. It was actually uh, there are methods that my father taught me. It was uh, he taught me how to create a poncho tent. And so he learned that when he was in the army and yeah. it's a very lightweight. You just have a brain poncho. And when the army learns that skill, like the first couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's, uh, that was my primary way of like going ahead and, and camping for a long time. And I remember this one time my uh, troop did a 50 miler down the American river in California. And while we were rafting a sudden summer lightning storm just hit us. And we're on water. What do you do when you see lightning? <laughs> you get out. <laughs> and so I get out. Uh, everybody else gets out. You know, there's a whole other like mini series. Like we had to get towed rescued and everything. And we landed this like camper, um, like RV campsite. And they said like, oh, come in, come in, um, take our garage. It's totally cool. But uh, what ended up being uh, an amazing memory was uh, my dad came with me on that trip. And while everybody was making the beeline to the garage to get themselves dry, he was making his way over to some trees. And I'm like, there's no, <laughs> it is lightning and thunder. It's raining cats and dogs. There's occasionally some hail. And I'm like, I'm going to, we're going to drown outside tonight. <laughs> and so we, uh, we pitch up our poncho tents on these tiny twigs. They're not even like on the main branches. And I had one of the best sleeps of my life woke up dry as and you a, and you never forget that memory no no never but you were looking for like what is my crazy dad doing what's what he doing yeah pretty much and and i'm like i'm his son i gotta do this <laughs> um yeah that's crazy how's your how's your drink coming it's it's good, good. um you know it's it's a again second place yeah 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 this one is definitely first place no doubt about it mm -hmm. so how do you like, how, like you know, as an entrepreneur, you have you know a thousand things to do every day. How do you make sure you do numbers one, two, and three versus number nine, nine, or one hundred? I think the night before, I think I'm off already. Uh, what's the number one thing I got to get done the next day? Like it cannot wait. It, it is a must-do activity. And so there's a great book. It's the one thing. I'm trying to remember the author's name, but again, if you're able to just do accomplish one thing and never need to go back on it, then that's just one thing off the checklist. And talk about this, like some people like, you know, I'm not making progress, but people don't realize, even if you only do one thing, that if things are important enough, that's still moving the needle forward, right? Like you, you've done something, you, you, you go even this one thing, right? Yeah, imagine you did that for 365 days. That's 365 steps in the right direction. And talk about how you do this. As, you know, entrepreneur, we're like, what's the saying? If you don't see the forest or the trees, like one time I make myself do every once in a while, I make myself like go back like six months ago, right? Oh, wow. I have done a lot of stuff for six months, right? If you just look at the day, like, man, I'm, I'm failing. I'm doing shit. But you look back in time, like, man, I've actually done this. I've done that. I've done that, right? Maybe it's not, maybe it's not, well, it's not, maybe it's probably not as fast as you, you know, not really probably, it's definitely not as fast as you want to go, you know, but at least you can see the progress you made, right? Yeah, there's, um, 
when I was at Hyundai, there was a lot of a lot of work that was being done. There's a lot of change, not bad change, but it's just like we were doing a lot of uh, upgrades across the entire company in terms of best practices. And so at, and because we were always busy, we always felt like we were behind. And we set very, very ambitious year-end goals. And by the time we hit those, the year it would end, we were, we didn't get, we didn't reach the expectation. But uh, I really, really, uh, uh, a good friend of mine um, that worked in a different department he was the national manager, or he is the national manager for systems. Saw how Margie, he, he would pull me on the side and say, you know, Eddie, it's uh, there's a lot of, a lot, people tend to overestimate what they can do in one year. But when they reflect on what they've been able to accomplish, you are often surprised. Yeah. So they it's, definitely are. yeah, it's, it's, um, I think that's very true. So here's one for you. So I was off in the army. And we used to always say in the army, you try to like do these long year plans, like three, four year plans, right? Plan out. We used to always say, how do you expect your plan a year out when I'm a, when I'm a six inch knife fight right now, right? Yeah. I think the same thing after me, right? You know, people like, they'll plan out, you know, do your five year financial, do this. We want to be like, dude, I'm on a knife fight right now. I'm trying to like make payroll. I'm trying to, you know, do this. I'm trying to do that. My developer just left, you know, I'm on a knife fight right now. I don't have time to do this, but you have to do both, right? You have to like, maybe split half between the knife and half between future plan in some kind of way, I think. Yeah. I mean, as a founder, you're putting how many different hats on at one time. So there, there's some, uh, there's some of that always. Um, yeah, what kills me too, like people say like, like you have a marketing person, marketing should be your number one focus. Then a product person, product should be number one purpose. You know, like all these different specialties, like this should be your number one purpose. Sales, you can't grow a company without sales, right? Like everything can't be number one, right? And one thing I failed a lot of times, like I'll focus on one thing uh, and I'll like, oh, I got to do this, right? So I have a trouble sometimes switching back and forth that makes any sense, right? That's, yeah. stuff, that's something I've definitely failed on. Like, I'll, I'll, okay, I'm focusing on this. I'm here. Oh, crap, this came up. Then you go over here, right? And then this goes like from here down to here, right? That's like, well, what's the thing where you have like these, all these, these uh, pails of water and stuff. You're trying to hold the water and stuff or, or juggling glass balls, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, when, are, when are you not doing that? And I would say that often it's the same thing when, when you are someone that cares about a problem, whether it's in a startup environment or in a corporate environment or just some sort of team environment, you're going to feel like that all the time. And it's, uh, if you like it, it's an amazing feeling to have. Cause I, I personally, I would say I thrive in chaos. I, I'm the kind of person that I love that, um, that reshifting of, um, or reprioritizing of, you know, what must be accomplished. And making your best judgment on call on that because it's it's you, you know who's the captain of that seat? It's actually you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so something personal, like so you, you have a girlfriend, right? I do. How long have y'all been together? Just over two years. So I'm gonna presume that your girlfriend supports everything you do, right? Yes. As far as let me rephrase uh, that. Your girlfriend supports you being an entrepreneur, the startup journey. She might support everything you do, but she supports the uh, entrepreneurship thing you're doing, right? I'm very lucky to have met someone that is very, very supportive in terms of, you know, my, my, you know, my dreams, et cetera. Um, it's again, she's a, she's quite the special gal. So talk about how hard it would be for you to be an entrepreneur if your girlfriend did not support you. I mean, maybe like, maybe like overly saying, stop doing this, maybe like, like you tell her your day, you're like, yeah, whatever, you know, like we're not supportive, so to speak. How difficult it would make it for you? I think it make it quite challenging. Uh, again, I I care for the people that are around me and I surround myself with. And so if someone if she were to do that, um, I would kind of go into care mode, which is like, oh my gosh, what happened? Um, are you okay? And so I would say again. If you can't take care of yourself, how can you expect to take care of others if you can't take care of yourself? And so in that kind of scenario, it's uh I I I do have a deep care for her. And so if um I, I really would never wish to have a, a casualty in terms of my pursuits in that way. Again, I would like to find figure out a way where there are none. And what does your girlfriend do? She's a, a data analyst for another startup, actually. Okay. Um, they're called Trivetta. They're a 
so she knows the lifestyle you're living all that kind of stuff it's not like she's working for corporate america and like anything like that she did so you see she knows at least she knows what you're doing oh yeah so she, she was plus. always uh very aware of what i've been I, again i never was uh i'm always an open book yes um so oh um are you gonna be doing any, any pitch competitions anytime soon? I'm trying to pitch those sales. sales. Like, <laughs> how, how do you go about doing sales? Like, are you doing sales yourself? Because they is out there. Like, if you're a founder, you have to do the first ten thousand MMR yourself. Other people say if you're not good at sales. You know, outsource it. It's all those, those different things out there. What are you doing for sales? I would say I, I'm the main driver of yeah. sales at this point. Um, and so you just like emailing people, or you like actually picking the phone up and cold call, calling people. Like, a lot what? of it is based off calls. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, so how do you have people answer the calls? Like, like me personally, a call comes in from random number. Like, I'm not answering that crap, you know. <laughs> like, how you how do you overcome that? Or I guess the thing is like get a relationship first, and then I'm gonna call you later. I guess. Well, I'm a huge believer in finding common ground. Mm -hmm. So whenever uh, you reach out to someone, there has to be some sort of reason that connects you two together. So, for example, something that. I, again, I recently started making a relationship with the department, U.S. Department of Education, specifically their um, rural education achievement pro um, programs. And it was because I went to an event where I was able to get in touch with uh, Chris Green, who was um, part of the Depar Washington Department of Commerce um, office specifically for economic development. He said, like, you know, what I think what you're doing isn't great for um, you know, at-risk communities. You should reach some out to some. So then I started reaching out to um, rural school districts and stuff like that. End up talking to and building a relationship with the National Rural uh, Education Association, which has a, a footprint across 42 of the 50 states. And from there, then was able to get in touch with the U.S. Department of Education. And so it's, I didn't know any of these people, but there was this common interest in making a, a positive impact for uh, risk or at-risk youth and it just again when there's a common goal when there's goals that are shared it's quite powerful and move the needle forward so let's say you play a lottery tonight and you hit the 100 million dollar lottery right what's the one person you're gonna hire to take this thing off your plate like you do it right now you're pretty good at it but like if you had the money you would pay without a doubt pay someone to do this for you to get off your plate so who specifically? Yeah, or, it was a position like social media, marketing, sales. I mean, if whatever they, the case would be. I mean, if they were literally sales and marketing professionals of some kind, um, yeah, if someone had a great expertise in uh, the educational landscape, that would be very, very uh, valuable. Um, a lot of uh, something I only learned recently, a lot of successful education technologies that are out there are because of founders who spent a decade plus in education, built the network already in education with trusted relationships, and then began their startup. And so you see you have like eight people working for you, right? In some kind of capacity. Mm -hmm. or these are broken down designers, developers, like how are they broken down? Yeah, so we have, um, well, there's one crazy founder. And then uh, there is my first partner in crime, the original partner in crime, uh, Zach Bouchard, he's our COO. He takes care of, he's basically the guy that he takes care of. So is he CEO or co-founder? Um, I, I would say Future Gen began as a, as a solo founder okay. and built a founding team. So why CEO versus co-founder? What was your reasoning beside that? And of course, there's no wrong answer. I just want to know. Yeah, I, I think it was because um, everybody else is on the team. They're all moonlighting it. Mm -hmm. So they're not. You know, they're, they're okay. still doing their So this guy's new line too, so to speak? Yeah. Okay. 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 So, um, but he was the first one that like, you know. And, was, and what kind of feedback have you got? A lot of people are like, I'll never invest you in a team, in a solo founder team. What's your, been your take on that? And, well, I guess feedback from investors. You say, no, I'm the, I'm the only founder. Have they said like, you need a tech co-founder, you need a co-founder. Or they'd be like, okay, you're a great guy. And like, you're, you're an overachiever founder. I'm going to invest in you. What's well, been your take on that? What's been your feedback so far? Well, I think there is a, there was a lot of initially i say oh we are a group of co-founders but if you go greater than three co-founders oh, yeah, yeah. i would say that creates that's, red, that's, flags that's big and, red flag yeah and, and a lot of uh you ha then suddenly have a lot of you're on the defense mm -hmm. of making relationships with investors because 
that seems like there's so many people that are involved to like who are the real truth. It's almost like you can't even make a decision on who the founding team is, right? Exactly. So typically I will say that I'm a I'm a you know solo founder that built the founding team. Mm -hmm. And you know, they'll ask questions. I like that phrasing. That. That's a, I like that phrasing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, we we built a pretty badass team my i mean again award-winning designer um you know those who uh, other management consultants that have done implementations of uh again statewide solutions for human potential you know phd educated fellows that are doing the academic educational research that's applied in the product um and then our software team oh my god um you know our cto he's uh i think he's done like five separate startups two of them have successful exits how do you find your software development team but like i think a big disconnect just my opinion like you have like these new developers like middle level developers trying to find jobs they can't find it they don't have experience you have non tech founders trying to find developers and they're like this they're missing each other right so how did you find yeah. your development team you know that's actually a really interesting story because uh we had a we had an initial engineer that was a part of us since, since the get go and um i again i i don't have a technical background so i'm like uh, i did not know in terms of like you know how, how do you measure success with uh you know someone like that um but so then i started this journey of but i knew he needed some guidance so i started off with this journey of like okay what is a what does a startup cto look like and so i actually had a series of learning points on how to find such candidates and initially, I used to just reach out to people that I thought look professional. Uh, you know, we were both Eagle Scouts or something like that. Um, but I would say after like the sixth, seventh attempt and rounds in terms of like reaching out to others, the secret sauce was actually the following, which was, hey, we're looking for, um, you know, CTO or, you know, software developers that are interested in being a part of us at the early stages of MVP and iteration and beyond and have the capabilities of leading teams. And so I actually made a LinkedIn's job post. I also, you know, posted on Angel's list. Um, and next thing you know, what I initially thought was going to be honestly a step in the wrong direction. We actually got started getting these amazing candidates. And I started having a series of interviews with all of them. Mm -hmm. And so I think we literally got like, Within 48 hours, we had like 80 people that applied for the position. And are you paying this person? No. And these were all people that I said, said hey, this is purely- You're uh, upfront, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, like I'm not trying to hide anything like that. And so from those 80, we narrowed down to 30. From those 30, we narrowed down to four. And then, um, then we found our one. Nice. And then he himself was able to, because uh, there, there's a couple of good things I think you got to look into a CTO too. So an advantage for us was that he also, the two other software engineers he brought on board with him, they have a history of building together. And so I think that sp speaks a lot about his character that he know that others also believe in him and his ability for judgment and character in, and uh, envisioning what, you know, what the next best, best big thing could be. And when you fundraise, I'm guessing you can use them to hire more people. Yeah, so with yeah. this next round, it'd be accelerating the product development, so bringing some of these engineers full time under house, um, and depending on the, the it could be also um, bringing in other members of the team on board too. Do you have like a prior like you no know, next 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 two developers, number three sales, number four marketing? Have you got that planned out? Yeah, so again, depending on the raise, so we have like two benchmarks or three benchmarks. Um, if we hit a 250K raise versus a 500K raise versus like, let's say a 2 million raise, um, each of them have different objectives to go ahead and meet the next milestone. So like, for example, I, I don't know if that's too much detail. No, it's not, it's not. Like for example, for the first 250K is, okay, rapid iteration of the MVP. We have people that are gonna be able to give feedback. Let's go ahead and start again, continue to augment a product that people love. Um, so that's why you bring in the software engineers in, in full time because we have the we have the loop with students now to get active feedback on our platform, um, and then also product market fit, um, and then also um, oh, sorry, no go ahead, oh yeah, and then you know on, honestly a little bit of a 
compensation to help me pay my bills too. You know? That would be nice, right? <laughs> yeah. That'd be nice. So I'm answer this. This one, I always have a challenge for some people ask me like, how much you're raising, right? Because mm -hmm. on one half, I go bare bones. I have one amount of money, right? But I won't go all out. You know, everything I want, everything I need, I see how fast it's a different amount. So how do, how, how do you ask that question? Like you like average or two or like you'd be, of course, I guess you have to based on the, the investor you're talking to too, I guess, but how do you like answer a question? Like, cause no, of course you say, some people say I'm going to raise 250. You can't do shit with that. Get the hell out of here, right? You waste my time. But then you say, I want to raise 3 million. That's unrealistic, right? What are you doing, right? So how do you, yeah. how do you answer that question personally? So again, I would say if, if the question is like, how do you determine the amount mm -hmm. is again, the point of a round is to get you the next steps. Mm -hmm. Um, so it should be based on milestones. Yeah, it has to be based on milestones. You have to have clear objectives in order to complete. So for for example, if he's allowed to us to go for a year plus and be able to um, get get rapid feedback and for us to rapidly accelerate on our product. But it's not going to do too much more than that. Aside from, you know, now if I was able to, uh, you know, fully dedicate everything, then maybe again, an increase in sales. Um, or us not having a better understanding of the loop um, versus a 500K, which is like, oh, we can actually maybe have mentorship and guidance and how to properly create a sales cycle for a acceleration of product market fit. There's one for you. How many pitch decks have you done? Yeah. <laughs> uh, more than fingers I have. <laughs> um, so like, for example, um, it seems so silly to me but we just started working with a uh, with a uh, potential marketing mentor because our team actually our weakest point is probably sales and marketing and we have all this you know technical and uh, ability in terms of application but when it comes to sales and marketing i would say that's something that is an achilles heel for us and so this person's like you know what's your sales deck look like and I'm like huh yeah yeah i, I had that like that ball moment maybe like six months ago like yeah, my sales deck. Oh shit, you're right. I need a sales deck. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it seems like such like a duh. Yeah, like, like like you should have one. Like how did I have this already? Like you like like you just want to kick yourself in the butt. Like what's wrong with me, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I'm, I was thinking. So that was like the latest iteration that we had. Yeah. Uh, so we have a series of iterations on our sales pitch deck. So yeah, it's 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 funny. It's like it's, that's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. then like you know, like you like you'll do a pitch deck and you practice it and then you like it, it like goes the cobweb. Like, oh shit, let me bring it back. You're like, why is it slide in here, right? What what did I think of, right? It's a slide in here, right? Yeah. You me, and then like I know pitch deck, I, I I compare like resume. Like if you give your resume to 25 people, you have 25 opinions. Give your deck to 25 people, you have 25 different opinions. And the matter is like all of them don't matter, you know, unless yeah. the only one that matters is the one who gives the money, right? There's, yeah, there's a, a special kind of weight to those who are paying up. <laughs> exactly. Um, so what, what's some, um, so someone's a new entrepreneur, let me make it like this. Hmm. Someone wakes up today and they, the light bulb goes off. I have this great idea. It's going to save, let's say, suppose someone has an idea to take their phone. Actually, actually I'll tell this quick story. So I used to judge these TAF hackathons, right? Yeah. TAF is like this school, you know what TAF is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I used to just, I just had one time, this, these three eighth grade had an idea where you would take your cell phone and, and charge it with the electricity in your body, right? Interesting. So let's suppose someone has an idea today and they came to you. All they have is the idea. My idea is like charge phones on my body, electricity. What do you tell them to do? I think it would depend on like, let's say they were eighth graders. Okay, let's, let's, they're, they're like the regular people. I'm all eighth grade regular people. Like, they're like <laughs> the more advanced. They're like, you know, like. Let's say like a young professional. Yeah, a young professional. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, again, I would give different advice. I'd be like, oh man, you have all this spirit already. There are these amazing programs. Reach out. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, again, um, is discoverability is a, a big challenge for, uh, I would say, the next generation. That's of, a good point. Of, um, uh, of entrepreneurs and problem solvers. But if I were going to go again and advise, like, let's say I met someone my age that was considering it, I think I would kind of, I, I, I know I would definitely approach it differently than I'm doing now. Um, so my advice to um, a mirror image of myself um, that it would, is considering the first steps, I would actually tell them, remember, every action you do, you should consider it an accelerant to what you figured out. So you know how people will go to investors and 
you should always go to investors because you figure something out and money is an accelerator. You just, it's gas for you to put your foot on the metal and you just to continue to do everything that's right. Well, the same truth is actually with your time. So I would advise, um, I advise the mirror image of Eddie, like, hey, if you're going to go full time into this, make sure you have enough insight where you are going to that time that you're now dedicating to it accelerates what you're doing. Um, if you haven't quite figured out, um, like really the next guiding steps, it's not taboo for a founder to also have a job alongside it. And so time is an accelerator as well. So, um, you know, I, I can't take back what I've done. I don't think I would have gone as far as I've gone today without putting full-time effort into what I'm doing and giving it my 1,000%. But I think it would have been also uh, that, again, everything you do should be considered an accelerator. So if you really think you have if it flushed out your idea enough where full-time effort is going to get you to the next to the next stages, then do it. If not, then it's okay to, again, ideate um, to a point where you don't like this. I found out enough time to time to hit um, hit the gas. Here's another question for you. Like now here in the Seattle, there's a lot of like startup meetings, you know, like mm -hmm. tech meetings, right? And of course they're mostly white middle aged people, right? You know. Yeah. So, and then you have like people like, you know, like, like, you know, less force of back demographic background. They just have great ideas, right? So is it the responsibility of the people doing the startup meetings to reach out to this other demographic? Hey, I'm doing this startup meeting. We want you here, come here, you know, make it more like more accessible. Always the responsibility of the people in the less demographic, like less on the first areas, like find these meetings and find the opportunity or is it a combination of both? Hopefully that question makes sense. I think it's a combination of both. And I, I think it's something that we actually iterate kind of in tangent with our product, which is, are you like, let's say again, those or those community organizers that are trying to build programs and opportunities for first time entrepreneurs, let's say. Um, something that I think is missed by um, a lot of problem solvers is that, are you building a solution that is contextually understood by the target demographic you're trying to serve. And so, for example, as a first time founder, you may not know you should be going to the town center or like community programs that are out there to learn about these opportunities. You, you would not know that because you don't know. But, you know, a lot of people may learn about these opportunities by Googling or finding like a, an investor Slack group or a startup Slack group or, excuse me, um, something of the sort where um, it, they, 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 again, they can contextually understand the messages that have been trying to be presented. So I think that is something that's missed in a lot of early product solutions that problem solvers do just as a whole conceptually, where they're building something that they realize is a problem, but is not, again, receptive to the target audience they're trying to support. Eddie, who are you, who are your mentor or your mentors? You know, I've had a I've been fortunate enough to have many mentors across my time, and it's uh, it's interesting how these individuals become mentors. Not because you're like, hey, I'm looking for a mentor. Uh, I like to form. It, it always happens naturally, right? Yeah, it's uh, always happens naturally. Exactly. Um, and I've had a number of people that made such an impact on my life that I, I don't know where I would be today without them. So next question, to me, this is an even more important question. Who are you mentoring? Um, today, I'm actually mentoring a few people. Um, the most people I do mentor directly now, I actually met them through, uh, um, I meet them through a program I, I made actually. So back in college, I, founded a club called the Davis Financial Analyst Society. It's supposed to help students pursue entry-level opportunities in, in finance. And so as a part of the initiative, I build career exploration programs and a very something I'm very proud of, a mentorship program that's there. So Eddie, mm -hmm. of course I'm sure this would never happen, you know, knock on this plastic table won't, but 
what would happen if someone when you play for you have to do for them you to let them go right like what what red line has to cross like do they have to lie to you not you know maybe mr mexico for 90 days in a row what would it take for someone like hey hey you know jason this ain't working out it's time for us to part ways so i unfortunately had to experience that about two three months ago and people don't realize like people always saying like if they're hr expert you know hire hire slow fire fast no one fire fast right no one wants to be the bad guy right yeah. like it's it always like i joke around don't fire eddie because it's his birthday don't fire Eddie because it's christmas time like the thing yeah. is like by the time you want to fire like jason everyone knows jason should go right and so the faster you yeah. do it, the best you can both move alive so how so how did you approach that so I would say this is something that I had to learn in the sense that a great strength that I have, but at times I had to learn to take remove that strength is I see myself as an includer. I find ways to have anybody that wants to support add value to whatever is the challenge, the obstacle or that's being uh, faced. And so I'm not going to say any names, but we had uh, one of our original founding team members um, they uh i would say they weren't as in it as everybody else was demonstrating across the team and you could see shifts of priorities on um you know what they wanted to do in their in their you know with their weekly commitments versus what the team um held as a standard mm -hmm. for their weekly commitments and so the way that our team handled it uh, was essentially uh, warnings mm -hmm. um you know you don't just you don't just say like, oh, I'm sorry, it just wasn't working out and just like chop it and go. It's, that's not how- And your team is like completely remote, right? Yeah. Um, so um, we, we do sometimes quarterly in-person mm -hmm. type of events, but yeah, for the most part, we're, we're remote. Um, so with this individual, it was, uh, it kind of, we gave like some, so it has some discussions like, hey, you know what, this is what we're noticing. Um, it, again, giving that feedback in terms of, what we're observing and at some point had to make that painful decision of removing and it was i didn't like it yeah it's not I easy not like people it. don't realize like people say i'm the master of firing whenever someone says i'm an expert of firing expert of hiring i'm like you're a fucking liar because no one's expert of hiring or firing it's like it's both things are tough yeah so um this next scenario uh let's put you in you're not, you're not hiring right you're not hiring you have no plan to hire anyone right i think we have a strong team where we're at yes so what would someone have to do? Like they listen to this video or this podcast, like, man, I'm really down with Eddie's team. I want to join his team. Like I know it's a startup. What would this person have to do to convince you to bring them on? You know, that would somehow probably touch my includer heart. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'll, I'll specifically say we are not hiring anything right now. There's, um, I would say though, if there was an interest in, um, providing some sort of level of guidance in sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. That is something that our team is beginning to uh, spread our wings in a bit more. Uh, and we're not afraid to admit like, hey, we have a lot of passion and drive that we understand that guidance would go a long way. Um, so if they someone reached out and they had said that they had a specific key love and tying to uh, what do you want to do in the future? And yeah, no, I would, uh, I would be interested. It's a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing, like, you never know where your next talent's going to come from, right? You never know, like, what, how your team's going to grow or not grow, so to speak. Yeah, that's true. Um, and so how do you have, a, like, a, a, what's called, like, do you have an equity plan already? Like, how you, like, you give an equity, like, your first few employees, all that kind of stuff? Of yeah. course, don't give me the details and everything, but, you know, like, yeah, we, everybody on the team, we have discussed compensation mm -hmm. packages, equity plans. Um, as the, as the, we as a company grow and succeed, it definitely is a shared, um, shared experience. Yes. So next, we were both in WTIA. I think it's, 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 it's a thing called Washington Tech Institute Association, I think. Yes, that's it. Now, how did you find out about that? Um, it was actually one of the earliest uh, um, organizations I learned when I first came to Washington. So again, I came in February of last year. And um, I think I spoke to, again, Nick Hughes, uh, Amelia, and they said, hey, you should talk to those WTIA people. And I think the first person I talked to was, was with Nick. I'm trying to remember his last name. 
Ellingson. Yeah, Ellingson. That's the guy. Um, and I uh, he explained more about the uh, his organization. I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool. Um, and so that's how we were. That's how I learned about it in the first place. And how did you meet Nick Hughes? Um, I literally just Googled like startup <laughs> events in my area in Seattle, and Founders Live popped up, and there was going to be uh, you know, a launch. Have you have you pitched there yet? I have. Okay, cool. I have. I what, did it with a different idea. Oh wow, yeah. What what month did you pitch here in Seattle? I did. Oh, the one about here in Seattle. You know what's funny? I think we actually pitched together. Did we? Yeah, yeah we did. Yeah, we yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, we did. We, yeah, we, we did. Yeah. On a uh, downtown Seattle. Spaces the the room. Yeah. It was, it was supposed to be on the on the 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 deck whatever we had to bring it inside because they forgot the tech stuff. Yeah, it, it was something like that. Yeah. It was it was a wonderful venue. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm a quick, quick, quick plug for myself. So um, I'm actually going to guest host Founders Live Seattle in June. We're doing like a military edition, be at the unit club in Tacoma. So I sent up more information about that pretty soon. And that's the thing about a startup founder. You always got to find like avenues to put yourself out there, right? You know, like to make yourself known. Like, like I love your saying now, building in public. Yeah, building in public. You know, don't be, be fearless. Yeah, be fearless because what you're doing is honestly w- would help so many people, especially thinking about it. Exactly. So moving on, how big do you see your company getting? Right, you want to be like the number one tech company in the United States? Do you see it like like expanding globally? Like, ah, uh, okay. You want to know about my world domination plan? Yes, yes, world really domination say, plan. There, right now, plans? on the record. You know, I'll, I'll tell you this. I've had a wonderful opportunity to speak with uh, some founding engineers at LinkedIn. And they said, Eddie, you guys are not future gen. You guys are the future LinkedIn killers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, we really think, so he, here's our uh, biggest thread of thought that is inspiring all of the innovations happening with us. We truly believe if we can help people navigate the question, what do you want to do in the future? Then why can't we not help the other half of the equation with the employers? What if we can help companies build uh, culturally fit teams and uh, with data, essentially, with, again, like the success metrics of those who are able to navigate? Um, And so with that thought, I, I think it's, again, the first brick we have to solve is how to best help navigate those through what they want to do in the future in a way that makes it an adventure, a journey, an experience that gets them excited and not this overburdensome um, expectation that's given on them and is expected of them. But after going through that, then the I think the next opportunity is really with being able to build these culturally themes. Um, across companies. And, and this is an experience I had in management consulting where um, unfortunately uh, companies go through a cultural change when they meet certain stages of growth and also stages of life. And so to really keep that company culture there and present and live and bursting and just always embering and ready to spark again, you have to be able to build um, a culture that everybody is a hundred percent for. So it's uh, in terms of footprint and all that. I mean, I think we can start from the earliest of ages up into even retirement, and they're trying to figure out what to do after their careers. I it, this is not just a U.S. problem. There are so many people that are trying to go to the U.S. and also people that are trying to um, exit the U.S. And so it's a uh, there's a team of eight, but in terms of footprint. We imagine ourselves being far larger and having a global scaled impact. Who, who are you compared to? Who else is like kind of sort of doing what you're doing right now? Um, you know, I, I would say there's very specific niches in terms of trying to solve the problem. So in terms of like today's iteration, I think um, Gladeo is a great platform that is also trying to tackle the same problem area. I think of uh, um, ADP, or not. Yeah, ADP List is another platform that's trying to do like mentorship. There's iMentor, which is also a great platform. Um, Again, we are all lovers of this problem space. Um, But the way that we apply it is, is, I think, a little different. 
Um, it, it, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of solutions that exist around what do you want to do in the future are, I think, fragmented um, instead of looking at a holistic picture. And I, I would like to think that our competitive advantage, especially long-term, is that we are looking at a holistic picture, not just a, a, only a specific niche. We're, we're going to own a niche, but then expand vertically and horizontally as best seems fit. Eddie, how does future gen fail? What, what causes you to fail? Uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's the truth. I mean, it's uh, a lot of the. <laughs> yeah, uh, give, give us a sec. Damn honest answer. Yeah. <laughs> give us a sec. You know, what I mean by that <laughs> is uh, I, my team, I think we have such a great balance of personalities on the team. Uh, it's very easy to to tell that I'm the dreamer um, of my team. I'm the guy who's envisioning what it's. So better. people on your team have to keep you grounded, so to speak. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, again, everybody respects me so much that they accept that you know whatever decision I make is what we're going to go with, um, whether I have majority shares or not. Like I think they they do that, um, but. It's, uh, I would say, as great as an advantage as there is to have one person that is really kind of doing the guiding, um, you know, next best steps for uh, an organization. If you start doing steps in the wrong direction, that's also, it's a, it's, it's a two-sided, um, double-edged sword, essentially. And so I would say the times that our team has gone into jeopardy and had to do course correction, luckily we have been able to do course correction, is when potentially... Uh, I've gone maybe narrow-sided or maybe don't look at the whole picture, not a whole thing, um, or at a whole um, landscape side. And so, excuse me. So um, I would say that's something that, again, this year, my biggest priority is applying focus. And I got to say, focus got us from zero to potentially over half a dozen pilot program users and discussing contract pricing. That's what the power of focus did. And I would say my lack of focus last year, I would say kind of it helped us with a lot of uh, fast learning, but at the same time, it, I think it potentially hurt us. So the follow-up question, of course, is what causes you to, to meet your global domination plan? What makes you succeed in everything you want to do? I think uh, there's not just one thing. I think there's always a... I think uh, there's a compass that I think entrepreneurs kind of innately are aware of, but maybe don't always necessarily act on. And it's something that I would say it is so crucial because if you don't have this honest reflection on are you keeping in pace or direction of this compass, then that is why your company will fail. So like, for example, I bet you're aware of this. Um, over a course of a year, I have met so many founders that I'm like, oh my gosh, we're going to do this thing. And they're no longer there. And you can often look at the fact of like, you know, what, what core principles did they no longer pursue or how do they drop? How do they fail? How do they, you know, not meet the next steps? And so it's interesting that even though, um, you know, we have not today have closed on a, a you know, on an investor or something like that. It's crazy that only one person that had one crazy idea, um, had but had a pa such a powerful passion, was able to build a network of um, individuals that became a team and um, have all these capabilities and um, come together in a way that, you know what, we know it's tough and we're going to weather the storm, but at the same time, it's because, not because the promise of, the green fields on the other side. It's that, and because we really, really do believe in you. Yeah, I know the popular saying is fail fast, but I think I think there's also something to be said of staying the course, right? Yeah. But they're being resilient, you know, getting knocked down, you know, because fail fast, what it means, go to startup weekend and do a thing for 96 hours and always oh, reading up customers. I think it's something to be said, like, those staying the course. Of course, you don't probably don't want to do it for 10 years, you know? Like, you know, that's probably, probably like too much, but you know, I think there's a balance between like, fail fast and like stay in the course getting kicked all the time. You know, as, as 
as counterintuitive it may sound, I think discipline is so important as a startup. Um, and, you know, we're supposed to be free going and, you know, uh, free floating, but I think discipline in terms of like, hey, measuring what success is and admit when it's actually a failure and move on from there. So, Eddie, so you're talking about your startup. Do you have any startup ideas? Any new? Yeah, new startup ideas. Um, well, I, I mean, I would say I'm a very observant person overall. And so there are a number of things I would say I have. So like, oh, that'd be cool. I bet that'd be something like it's, that's a lot more doable. Like, mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, is it my calling? Is it the impact I wish to have yeah. in the world around me? Not necessarily. But, you know, if you, if you want to hear some crazy fun ideas, I, I don't mind. Yeah, just one crazy idea. Okay. So here's my personal favorite. So I think people are greatly spirited in the holidays, but don't necessarily always want to own and deck out their, their homes for Christmas or an Easter or a birthday or for a wedding, like and own everything. So this idea involves what if you were able to go all out for the holidays and decorate your home, but you don't have to own the decorations. So like a rent a decoration thing? Kinda. So think of it as like, hey, we give you like a care package of decking out your house, like let's say for Christmas. Um, here, here is like your, uh, you know, here's everything from the elves to the candy canes to, um, you know, the inflatable floats that you can put in Christmas lights and everything. Um, and if you want to keep it great, you have purchased it. If you don't, then you can return it to us. And for the next year, we can go ahead and rotate out across like you know, another care set for or care package for another family. Okay. So you you come to remote. Is, is everyone in the Seattle area or the, across the United States, across the world? So we have two in Seattle, uh, another two in California, three in Las Vegas, and another one in uh, Washington, D.C. So I'm a big believer. People disagree with me. Like, remote work's not for everyone, right? It's just not right. A lot of people, they need, like, no, they have to come to the office. They need, like, guidance. They need to be told one, two, three. What's your test or plan? Or what if you have to be, like, make sure people you hire actually can do remote work? You know, I would say everyone can have a pres like a preference, but I think there is like a setting in the times. So for me personally, I do love working in person. Um, I, I do love it. I feel like there's a sense of collaboration that comes up when it's more than just voice, audio, language that can be um, conversed. I think it's body language. I think there's like a flow. Um, but at the same time, it's what's, how are you going to be competitive? And so I do think that remote work is definitely here to stay and a way to go. I, again, future-wise, do plan on having, let's say, monthly slash quarterly like meetups of some kind across the company uh, that is in person. But um, in terms of getting the work done, I don't think we necessarily have to always be together to make that done. I agree. So there's a company out of San Francisco called Flows.com. There's a, like a sales company for startups. I actually use them. Hmm. And they're 100% remote, always have 100% remote. They have like people from like India, California, Brazil. Well, like, the cool is like once a year, the owner, Stella FD, he brings all the girls for a week, right? Like they yeah. went to Ireland, Brazil, San Antonio. Each year, they go to a different place. I think they have like 95 employees right now. I think they went to Dublin, Ireland last year. They every one week, hmm. they, and it, it's not even work related. They just go there and hang out, right? For one week together. No work related, nothing like that. Just go for Dublin or wherever for one week and just hang out, right? That's one thing I want to do, right? Have a totally remote, but once a week, we like go somewhere cool and just hang out, right? Yeah, and I think that's really cool. And I think it's it's sir it's for a certain um, I think because it's tough to team build when you're like a remote team. Yeah, and I would say like our team does feel a certain knitness, but a lot of it actually happened when we were all were in, were in person. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the first time our team met in person for the first time. That was a magical moment. I was like, yeah. oh my god! So do you and this like. Dude, I didn't know you were six six. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 true, and 
then that's when you can have like your tiki night bars and stuff mm-hmm. like that it's like and then you share stories that they're not just work related it's and they as an opportunity to learn more about each other and so i guess you you, you like slack a lot uh, i would say slack is probably our favorite okay. preferred method but right. you know, and like how does your team work like you have like meetings over zoom like once a week or like does like one person does this well it's called asynchronous i can't say the word like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Or you're running something like that where if everyone does their own thing and like you, you're checking with Eddie once in a while or like is like or you have like like deadlines and meetings once a week more structured. So with us, we meet daily. Okay. So we meet Monday through Friday, um, and it's set up as a check-in. Mm-hmm. So it's an opportunity for anybody to go ahead and voice challenges or have questions and have them answered or get guidance. And also give an update in, on progress since last check-in. And you say you have something in D.C. So you're in Seattle. Is the, is the company run off Pacific time or a different time zone? How does that work? Pacific time. Okay. So if you're in D.C., it just sucks to be you then, right? <laughs> so our <laughs> – oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Our, David David would definitely uh, drink to that. <laughs> um, so he, At least he's not in Thailand. Oh, my gosh. I remember, like, the most confusing time – zones i've had to work with is with uh india in particular because of the half an hour yeah i think it was like oh my god it's a half an hour ahead yeah afghanistan's the same way afghanistan's like half hour off yeah it was like yeah i totally screwed you up i didn't know that yeah afghanistan half hour half hour thing too yeah i get confused um but yeah so he on the other hand i would say he has a special arrangement with us where again he is leading our academic uh education research arm he's our chief science officer so a lot of his work is independent so he and I keep in close tabs, and every once in a while, I'm like, hey, there's going to be some big announcements. We need to uh, come in. Um, so I would say he more, um, lays off, uh, lays our affairs. But um, he and I, we, we talk, if not every day, at least every other day. So this is probably too, this is probably my head. This is probably too early for you, but have you do you have a plan, or have you thought about doing like couple relations? Um. Nah, I have other problems. Yeah, that's way first. too early, right? Yeah. Um, it may sound like maybe you come to like start to waste money on public relations, you know? Yeah, I mean, if you do do it right, our team has been published before yeah. on newspapers and stuff like that, and it wasn't paid PR or anything yeah. like that. Um, you know, it's uh, again, we've been described as an uh, innovative technology solution um, in Monterey County. Um, you know, we've been um, so it's you don't have to do like. Yeah, you don't have to get this big famous PR company, and like you don't have, you don't have to do a Super Bowl ad, nothing like that. Yeah, I I rather I- I invest that in something different. I mean, perfect stories like Coinbase did a Super Bowl ad like last year, like two whatever two years ago. Yeah, and then four months later, they laid laid off like twenty percent of the company off. Like, dude, are you fucking kidding me, right? Yeah, there was, a lot happened, uh, in that, in crypto. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was a weird story. Um. So Eddie, is there anything I, I have not asked you yet that I should have asked you? Hmm. Um, well, I already, you already know my favorite superhero. You already know who, like, where to get the the best enchiladas around. Um, unfortunately, I'm not the I'm not the one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, I think there's maybe one thing I like to talk about, um, and that's who is Gen Z. If you don't mind if yeah. I speak a little bit about yeah. that, because yeah. I feel like there's a lot of confusion on that. Um, so if I can, this is not a shameless plug. It's, it's more like a, a strong opinionated piece that I have. Yeah. <laughs> so I often get the question, like, who is Gen Z? And in the academic realm and in uh, actual practice, I think it's very different. So it, again, I've done a lot of academic research. I've been a part of a, a number of associations that you know they they do follow best practices in terms of um, measuring success etc and defining demographics but in my opinion who gen z gen z is more than just the uh people that are born between 1997 to 2007 these people are in the classroom and you shouldn't necessarily think of them as you know uh these are migrant students or these are um you know high achieving students or these 
people come from low income families or these people are middle class or these people have, go to private schools and stuff like that. I, I really, really think you were thinking about in the context of high schoolers, uh, Gen Z high schoolers today, they are, they're honor students. They are athletes. They are cheerleaders. They are content creators. They are digital um, natives. They are have a strong sense of ownership and imagining and, and, and responsibility in terms of what the future can be like. They have a strong liking towards the environment. They are self-actualized in terms of like, I, I wish my work does, does purpose. And so uh, a lot of current statistics that I think are set in place that define demographics, especially for Gen Z, I think they need to be a little bit more reimagined because um, there's a reason why we're seeing success and asking students today, you know, instead of asking them, what do you think about how great is your reading comprehension? That's, that's just so dull. It's, it's, it's not a, it's not a question that excites and gets those uh, in the extra engaged, but being able to show them how their interests are applied in terms of career and educational possibilities, I think is so important and makes things so much more relevant. So again, I think edu um, Gen Z is more than just a, a statistic. It's, they are um, their own culture. They will ask you questions. They will ask um, why rules are, are the way they are set. Um, so I think there's a lot more qualitative than just looking at it and just in terms of, oh, they are um, these, these statistics. Sadie, thanks for that. Can you quickly like, cover like some myths of Gen Z? You know, like, I, I, know, I, I, I made my wrong, but what, didn't say Gen Z is like the Tide Pod generation, you know, eat the Tide Pod, you know, like, what are some myths about Gen Z that like, you know, like totally off the wall and like are totally disapproved? I personally don't think Gen Z is um, unmotivated. I don't think that they're lazy. Um, I do think that unfortunately they have a little bit of a, they're very, one of the most aware generations of what's going on around them. Um, I mean, cause they grew up with like an internet from day one, right? Like, they yeah. know how to do tech like like no one's business, right? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, I show people how to connect on LinkedIn using a QR code, and they think I'm the CTO. I know, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I know exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. like, I, 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 so I gotta tell the story. Go for it. So I got the army. My second job in the army, I was an HR for, for, for a, a local college, right? Mm -hmm. So, so with like eight people working for me. I'm there. I, I know, like, you know, I'm observing. So I know people. I know people, like, they're typing stuff on the computer. They're printing it out, making pen and ink changes. This is like, man, um, like, I say 2017, right? So pretty recently, right? So typing stuff on the computer, printing it out. Someone's reading it. They make pen and ink changes. They take the, the paper and, and, and read off the paper, right? Yeah. I'm like, what are y'all doing, right? This is how we make a record. Like, I saw them on Google Drive. Like, how you can make you know stuff in the, like on the line, right? Mm -hmm. And they literally said, "How long this has been out? This is this is it's fantastic. Like since 2000, right?" <laughs> and they thought I was like a CTO, right? So everyone's like telling me to text stuff, like, "Dude, like, no, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how to do this, right?" And it's just amazing, like people like like oh, they're in their routine, right? They do the same thing over and over again. They don't realize the possibility of like stuff being better, right? Yeah, it's, it's, again, it's, I, I want everybody to know I'm not the, the CTO of my, my company. I, I can show you how to connect on QR codes on, on LinkedIn, though. Um, I'm pretty sure you know, like, like I, I like to say, like, I'm the most tech, not tech person, you know, like, I know how to set up AWS. I know, like, front end, back end is, right? I, I, I can speak a language, right? But am I going to get down and code something? You know, because, like, First of all, it'll probably take me 20 years to code one line of code, right? <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's amazing the stuff you learn. It really is. I, I think uh, when you're able to own your superpower, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's quite powerful. However, you, you are dangerous in the greatest of ways. Um, so like, for example, your knowledge of HR, I bet it goes 
way beyond if I were to start like right now. And it's um, I, again, I don't, I think people should be shameless of what makes them uniquely them, because again, there's only one you, and you once you own that superpower that is makes you uniquely yourself, no one can catch up to you. That's that's a great point. Everyone has a superpower. Yeah. So Eddie, what's what's some of pet peeves you have? Uh, pet peeves and in... anything personal, professional, like. Like for example, me, one of my pet peeves is crazy. Mm -hmm. Like clothes, my, my clothes are dirty. Okay, if I throw them in the laundry bag, so fall off, I don't care. But I have something clean, like supposed to have something right at the laundry, a lot of the washing machine dryer. If I the floor, I, I go back to crazy. Like I can't. That's one of my pet peeves, right? I cannot stand clean stuff on the floor. I guess a random pet peeve I have is uh, I appreciate it when people put the toilet seat down. Do you? I do. Okay. I do. It's uh, it, it's kind of funny. Um, my uh, my girlfriend does put the seat down, mm -hmm. but she only started noticing that after uh after meeting me. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's, it's like a random view, yeah. But it's um, I don't know. It's just like, yeah. Like again, so there's some total random. So yeah. this is one good thing about remote work that people don't realize. I don't think like, suppose you like you have eight people, right? You know, uh -huh. suppose you all you came to the same office, right? Mm -hmm. Different personalities, different whatever. One person is going to do something that kind of annoys everyone else, right? It might be something that's like maybe they slurp their coffee or like they talk too loud or they type too loud. But in your office together, people do things that annoy you, right? And it drives you yeah. back to crazy. Right? If you're remote, you don't hear that stuff, right? <laughs> I know that's like kind of random, like kind of weird and that stuff, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, again, there, there are some things I love about working from home. Like, for example, I love that I don't have to technically commute. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I'm still waiting for the Star Tech technology to come. You know, beam me to downtown Seattle. You know, that would fix everything, right? Oh my gosh, yeah, that would be a dream too. And, and so, like, I'm going off space here. Like, so, like, we went to the moon in 1969. Yeah. Why in the fuck are we not on Mars already? Right? Like, to me, it makes no sense. Right? Like, 50 years. You would think so. We went from like no moon program in 1960 to the moon in 1969. It's like. And I read this, I, had, I, saw, I saw this news article or news series. They were saying, like, they theorized, like, the reason we're not on the moon now, on Mars now, because, like, in 73, the, the Apollo 13 almost, like, killed everyone. So Nixon killed the, killed the space program, went to the space shuttle. And I think people realized, like, you know, the moon is one type of rocket. And then Elon Musk said, yeah, space shuttle is another space rocket, right? Yeah. And so you, you actually, like, degrade our capability, you know? And now people are trying to catch up. You know, I think it's a, a big reason why uh, a lot of innovation like that occurs is because there is how better to define competition. That's a great point. And so, I mean, at that time, you know, I, I love history. I think there's, a, you know, um, a lot of truth to the saying, um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe I'm, I'm forgetting the, the author who wrote that. Um, anyways, um, he's, uh, I, I, you know, there's that space race time, like mm -hmm. 1968 to 1970. Yeah. There's so the cold much. war, but Nick first, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There was civil rights that were going on. There, there was so much stuff that was going on right there back then. And the space race is just one of them. And so I think because of the competition that was going yeah. on, um, kind of forced that. And now today there is new competition with space development exploration mm -hmm. capabilities it's it's amazing um i remember i was you know fanboying over elon musk recently and i was reading up on his like latest rocket mm -hmm. you know i think they want to launch like a rocket that goes straight into space i didn't know it's like five thousand tons yeah. five thousand tons that's insane one thing i, I my, one of my bucket list i want to go to the, the spacex launch and like i think it's the browns retail i want to see an actual spacex launch oh really that'd be amazing yeah i want that's my, my bucket list thing i see the spacex launch. if you get the details let me know yeah. man um have you heard of this app let me pull it up it's called next space flight no what's that about it 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 shows you every space flight across the world china russia it'll show you like next space flight from china and this looks the payload is all the details. Hmm. I I can't say I have. I'll send it to you. Yeah, I uh, 
if you also find out how to see the uh you know the aurora let yeah. me know too i mean again it seems like we both admire the stars yeah definitely definitely um so eddie what's the what's the can you share your social media with some people reach out to you yeah sure um i'm most active on linkedin so um eddie Mazuregos at, at future essentially um you know you can also probably find me if you went through our, our website which is future gen uh xyz.com we definitely do have a uh a uh instagram um but i would say we probably have uh, more visibility on on linkedin Everything. um but yeah we're, we're beginning to expand that again in theme of building in public um we're beginning to put ourselves out there a bit more so if you're like you're, you're trying to reach out to high school students so let me backpack do you have a tiktok account no i, I would think <laughs> you need one because like you're trying to reach out high school students all of them are tiktok right yeah so it's like that's the space you should be in it's definitely something that I would say our team wants to own capabilities in with. Um, and I definitely would say that we have an immense, uh, again, uh, I feel like it's something that is low hanging fruit that we could do. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know. I definitely think you're killing, killing on there, right? The stuff you're doing, like short stories and stuff. I mean, we're all about transparency, authenticity, owning who you are, like knowing your interests, knowing your future, how to make an impact. I mean, like, I do feel like we could have quite a bit of success that's there. Um, it's just something new. Yeah. Um, so would you describe yourself as an introvert or extrovert or a combination? You know, if I had to go, you know, red pill or blue pill, um, I think I'm someone that is okay with being alone. Mm -hmm. But when I have a reason to speak, I will be the like the the an advocate to the end yeah and that will get me outside yeah that will get me pushing that will get me reaching finding a limit this is me like this is my like it's a kind of weird across strings like i like, suppose like i love like being around people like going to network events going to like i don't know of course not clubs anymore like going to starbucks whatever being around people but mm -hmm. i have i don't have to talk here right I'm more than happy, like sitting down at the table by myself and observing people, right? Which is kind of strange, of course, you know. <laughs> well, I think there's a an advantage to being an observer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't think people often listen enough, and when they don't listen enough, they often uh, I don't know how how can you really? That's something I I think is something that's very important for founders, especially and problem solvers in general is uh, your ability to really properly listen and there's different types of listening mm -hmm. um it's not just audio yeah i think is also are you really listening yeah what's the saying uh most people what's I, i'm gonna get this wrong most people listen to respond but you should listen to understand that's the first time i heard that but i like it a yeah. lot yeah most people don't listen to understand they listen to respond you know i um uh, I don't get in arguments frequently, but whenever I've noticed I'm in, in a discussion with someone where it's, there's no pause between to exchange. Like, oh, <laughs> You're like, dude, can you take a breath so I can jump in? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I especially, I will end a conversation on the spot. Yeah. If I notice, like, let's say you and I were having a heated discussion mm -hmm. and the moment I stop speaking yeah. you immediately jump on to the next yeah. thing because th that means to me that you probably are stuck on a thought yeah without uh processing the you know mm -hmm. the fresh input and at that point there there's there's no way to collaborate there's yeah. no way to have a shared discussion yeah my thing too is like if you talk with someone we'll say we have an argument with someone you know mm -hmm. argument and they talk start talking way louder than you to me like you won the argument right like if someone talks louder, they start talking louder to you to make a point. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you've lost, right? I've won, right? Well, it's who has the best cool, mm -hmm. um, calm, collective. Again, typically, I think when people get erupted that way, it's because they don't know how to properly communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, or again, like you know, yeah, technically, I think you've also won the argument, yeah. and they will then resort to something that is lesser. Um, I'll approach yeah so we talked about your parents earlier mm -hmm. what do your parents think about you being an entrepreneur being a startup journey because a lot of parents you know like <laughs> you know they're like you know you know what are you doing work for 
stay a management consultant, get the money, blah, 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 get your benefits, you know, be secure, so to speak. So what do you think about your entrepreneurial journey and the, and the big risk you're taking? I have had my parents on a roller coaster since 18. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, you know, I come from an uh, immigrant family, uh, you know, first generation college student. And so, you know, I was raised in a household that said, you know, study hard, you know, become the next lawyer, doctor, engineer, or something like that. And it's so, like most immigrants that want that for the kids, right? Be a doctor, yeah. be, be a whatever you case be. You know? Yeah. And, and it makes sense because those are a lot of um, occupations where it's seen as, oh, you, you, you were successful if you, need, if you do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did, you know, put my head down, I studied hard. I, I got accepted into a medical apprenticeship program at Harvard University mm -hmm. before going to college. And so you can imagine mom and dad there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my God. They told all their friends, like posted on Facebook everywhere, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. We're going to have a doctor in the family. Um, and I remember when it was the time to apply for college, you know, I wrote everything for environment or for uh for medical, um, medical related. And second to last day before all the first statements were due, I scratched everything, anything that's medicine related, and rewrote them for environmental sciences. And I did this all. Did you tell your parents this before you did it? No. This is smart this is in move, November. Smart, smart move, smart move. This smart is in November uh, during Thanksgiving break, and so my family's all together, and you know I we're uh, we didn't have like we were, you know, getting ourselves in a better spot. So we only had one family desktop, and as a course in the living room in front of everybody. And so I'm writing my personal statements, just in the prompt box, and uh, hit submit. You're a brave guy. You're or a, a you're, fool. You're, you're a I got lucky. Dude. I gotta um, give you props. That's bravery right there. By the luck of God, the paper was read by the right people. <laughs> and uh, I was able to continue my journey. But yeah, it's so, yeah, when I was accepted into uh, school, not doing medicine, my family was like, what? What are you doing? What's environmental sciences? Um, and then going to school and then telling them, like, oh, yeah, I changed my major to finance. They're like, they're like, at least that's money. So you're going to be the guy in the bank now? You're going to be the... <laughs> like, make up your mind. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, you know, I think my, it was my parents for the longest time, even after I graduated and I started, like, working for corporate America and doing management consulting. Can you imagine trying for, like, you know, a, a migrant immigrant family to, like, try to explain that? Yeah. It's like, yeah, uh, they do well. They travel. Make yeah. lots of money, work hard, long hours, make lots of money. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's a uh, so I would say they've been quite some ride. A lot of decisions I've made, I would say, a lot of even my mentors have greatly suggested against it. But I've often have had the greatest growths uh, occur in my life when I reach. You have answered the question pretty easily. I think. What advice do you have for someone in high school who? Parents are pressing them to do one thing, but they're passing to something else. You know, I think it's, uh, I can definitely understand and relate that we don't want to disappoint those that, you know, that we care deeply about. Um, dads, parents, um, guardians, you know, role models. Uh, you know, you don't want to disappoint people that we look up to. And I would say that I think you'd be quite surprised how much that these people that are in your corner are actually rooting for you, whatever you decide. But it's, uh, it's, we have to be, have the honest reflection and communicate that because if we don't communicate, they're going to continue to think that you've always wanted to be that doctor. So here's one for you, like something that's like really personal. Let's suppose that someone's out there, they're in high school, college, where the kids may be. And the relationship is not the best for the parents, right? For whatever reason. So how do you recommend that person fix it? Is it the, is that the, the kid's responsibility, the parent's responsibility? What would be advice on that? Well, I think in any relationship, is a, there's a two sides and it's a two-way street. Um, the moment one side does no longer reach, then I think that there is a different approach to it. So, for example, if you're in a, a, an unfortunate environment where maybe uh, you're not able to also communicate what your visions are, what your dream is um, with a you know, adult figure that you look up to, 
then I think you're already taking the first initial steps and having the honest reflection of like, hey, is this something that I would make me happy? Uh, is this something that I think gets me, you know, keeps me going? Um, because I I'm telling you right now, um, if you are ever doing anything that is less than your passion, then you're, you're going to have a, a little bit of what if in you. And that will eat at you in a specific way that is, will follow you. Eddie, two part question. Number one, what makes you sad? And number two, what makes you happy? Hmm. Well, I'm a very optimistic person. So yeah, yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I find sadness when I disappoint others. Um, especially those that put a lot of trust in me. Uh, and I would say, you know, that I'm not afraid of failure. Failure doesn't make me sad. Um, but in terms of knowing that my failure may have an impact on others, it saddens me mm. when, you know, um, something I truly believed in and best of thought and capabilities ended up falling short. Um, now, on the other side, the flip side of happy, a lot of things can be happy. I mean, I, I can be happy with, you know, waking up and seeing my dog that's there. And he's just like, oh, hello. Um, or I'm going to go home after this. And he's going to be like, oh, my God, where were you all day? Um, it's five o'clock somewhere. Let's go walk. Like, <laughs> um, you know, there there is so many ways. This is a little bit outside of the discussion, but I think it's. Um, hey, so I hate to do this. I got to use a bathroom. So I'm going to let you talk about what you want to talk about, right? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go ahead and show this yeah. little input. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. So I, I think something that I has to be spoken about is that I think you should be proud. Be proud of what you do. If you're proud of what you do, then you're able to go ahead and I believe that's fuel for you to go ahead and always keep going. And so, you know, if if you're great at music, even though people are telling you that's not going to give you the job, or if you love helping others in or making people look good through, um, you know, barber activities or hairstyling, I would say go for it a hundred percent because you'd be surprised where that leads you. It's again, if you're proud of what you do, then that encourages your um, curiosity that encourages you to explore further. And you become so impassioned in what you do that why would anybody else go to, why would somebody go to anybody else other than you? You are the subject matter expert. You're the one that, you know, it's, they know how to talk to, to kids and guide them into a better future. So it's, I'll be frank. I am very strategic. I am very, very um, aware of let's say how to maybe get from current state to future state at large organizations. But that's not exactly my passion. My passion is this, uh, helping others figure out what comes next. It's something that I was able to, you know, I encountered my whole life and I see so many people going struggle through, including, you know, those who are close to me. Um, and so I'm very proud of what we're doing at Future Gen. And with that pursuit and with that hunger, we've been able to go ahead and innovate in a way that has, is not being done anywhere else. And so if you are great at a sport, if you're at a subject and it makes you happy and proud of it, then own it. That I think will help lead you to your superpower, to your uh, drive, and to honestly, again, it gets you excited for tomorrow. Pursue it. You're not wasting your time when you pursue your passion. I don't care what anyone else tells you. Well, I got to say, if I had to, just a few more uh, little inputs while Jason's out there, um, I do want to let you know that if you're ever in need, I too am also in your corner. I support you and whatever you do. And if you were, I guess you're saying in the initial start of trying to figure out what you want to do or on the cusp of maybe taking the next best steps, I would say speak out on it because 
you'd be surprised who else is there in your corner. And we can't help you unless you speak on it. Welcome back, Jason. Thanks. That's the second time I do that. I did it one time before, so I did a podcast. But like, man, like, I can't hold them. I got these glasses. It's okay. I'm a. We're all human. <laughs> yeah. So Eddie, you give a lot of great value, great advice. But can you give us any last minute advice on anything you want to talk about? Oh, I may have just done that. <laughs> we probably did. Too. Um, I mean, if I'm gonna add further on to it, um, I think something that is quite interesting, and it's something I'm learning right now, and so I wish it was advice that I was able to apply, um, to to myself in earlier days. It's uh. Again, when you're pursuing a passion and an interest, you're never truly wasting your time. And it's very, very easy to uh, get confused with that, uh, with, with the following, I guess, assumptions. I personally believe that we live in a society that breeds people to live in a society. And success that looks like in today is you go to school, you do great, you go to college, get a job, and that's success. But I tell you that success looks very different to everybody. And please have that honest reflection with yourself because if you do that and you do that sooner rather than later, you're going to live a much more fruitful life, happy life, well-balanced life, and something that you're proud of. So and that's a great point. So I actually saw this on TV maybe a couple of days ago. There's a guy named Steve Hartman, Steve that these different stores, these, these right? And so he just stored this guy and tipped in Indiana, a uh, pizza delivery guy. This dude has been delivering pizza for 31 years. And other people are like, what a fucking loser, right? Like, <laughs> you deliver pizza for 31 years. And it's a full time job, right? Delivering yeah. pizza, right? Are you kidding, right? What, what's wrong with you, right? But like, it was like, no, he gave value. Well, he, like, he gave everyone a good experience. A lot of people are like, I'm about this, like, a lot of people you only see is the pizza delivery guy, right? Because yeah. people so lonely, right? And, it, and like he would do stuff like, of course, you take tips, right? He wanted, he did want to take a tip because he had a record change. So, so people talk about this, like, he was like, off 50 cents, he would drive two miles to the convenience store to bring the exact change back hmm. before he get tipped. And so this can be, I have no idea how many people in Indiana, but this town pitched in a bottom of brand new 2020 23 Chevy Malibu, right? Interesting. And you think like, though, a pizza delivery dollar, right? Like, how do you add value? How, but he, but he, he like, this in this community, right? A pizza delivery driver. So if you can add value to a pizza delivery driver, what do you think you, you can do, right? And, but you, you can add value in different ways. Yeah, there's countless ways to add value to the community. You know, it's, and, and you'd be surprised. Again, there's so many different ways to also actualize that value. Like, for example, I'm trying to remember this gentleman's name, but he's a, he's a barber. And I really think cutting hair is an art. You're talking about Vic Blends? I think so. He has like white guy, a bunch of tattoos. Yo, different guy. Huh? I'm thinking of a different guy. Okay, this guy's talking about Big Blaze, the white guy, a bunch of tattoos. He'll walk with something like, can I, can I bless you with a with with haircut today? You gotta like ask him the life story and stuff. You know, it, it's very possible. I do think he's, uh, he's a different gentleman. Okay. Think, you know, but I bet they have some similarities. Mm -hmm. I, I bet these are two people that are pursuing their passion and love for, you know, cutting hair and making people look good. And I bet you today, they are not just doing that. They're able to go ahead and spread their story. And let me tell you, they're, the way that they are actually able to actualize their value is more than just by cutting hair. And the thing is, like, you just can't wake up and I want to cut hair, right? It, it's a craft, right? You got to practice over and over again, right? It's an art. It really is. It's, oh, yeah. Like, I've got quite a few fucking haircuts in my day, you know? <laughs> I feel everyone has. So, Eddie, um, any, any other thing you want to talk about before we get out of here? You know, I think uh, <laughs> I definitely know if my team was listening, they'd probably be like, oh my gosh, we got to listen to him after this. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know what? I, I'm going to probably save that for another time. Okay. But yeah, no, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Jason. Eddie, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. And so listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.